single step. A decision to open the door, to see what's out there. <laughs> to see what's inside you, what the world has to offer, what you can give, what you're made of as you dream about what you can make. You will build and you will fall. But each day, you will be wiser, stronger, and above the rest. You will soar. And one day, even as you keep moving forward, you'll pause to take a look back. You'll reflect on all you've learned, on all you've seen and everything you have done. Be grateful you took that first single step on a journey of discovery at the Northwest University. Thank you for sharing our dream. It came true and we're sharing it for the first time with you today. It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? A feat of engineering produced by the Northwest University's Faculty of Engineering. Built for speed, efficiency, and it looks good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Northwest University's Faculty of Engineering Open Day. Tonight, we'd like to tell you a little bit more about all sorts of engineering, as well as how uh, uh, the kinds and the areas of specialization built into uh, the solar car that you see here. Tonight you learn about engineering from the practical to the content to the academic side to the joy uh, that it can bring in your world. Welcome, I hope you enjoy it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's such a great pleasure to have you here with us tonight, live, and uh, from wherever you are watching, uh, welcome. It's so nice to have you here. We're going to tell you all about the Faculty of Engineering at the Northwest University. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the videos who, uh, that started out our little uh, run here up until uh, half past seven. I think we'll keep you busy. 
throughout the evening, we'll tell you all about the different subject fields and focal areas and areas in engineering uh, that you can study here at the Northwest University. Uh, our room is filled with experts, both lecturers, people from industry, uh, senior students working in all sorts of places here at the university and working specifically so on our solar car, which is something we'll focus on quite a lot tonight. Uh, we are live, so you're more than welcome to ask us a few questions. Uh, we would like to hear from you, so we are streaming live. Just log in uh, with your Gmail account and uh, you'll be able to, on YouTube, ask us a few questions or make a few comments. Uh, it'll be fed through to us here, uh, where we'll sit and we'll uh, be able to answer all your questions. Feel free to do so. So over the course of the evening, in, in, in more or less half an hour slots, uh, we'll move from the one to the next. We'll start off with a bit of an overview of the faculty uh, and also talk about the solar car. It's a magnificent thing if you've never seen it before. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll have a run through of all the different uh, focal areas and subjects within uh, the Faculty of Engineering. Electrical, electronic and computer engineering, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, we'll talk about... Uh, mechanical engineering, industrial engineering, and throughout we'll give you information as to how to register, how to apply, uh, what to do once you're here, what to do if you just want to be here. So regardless your age of, or, or where you are in your life, uh, tonight we'll provide you with answers uh, in engineering. Now, whenever I speak to the people in the Faculty of Engineering, I'm fascinated by the projects that they do and the contribution they make to science. Uh, the contribution to science is not just an academic one. It gets very, very practical. So you'll hear from alumni of the faculty about where they are positioned in life and what they're doing now with their, uh, uh, with their knowledge and expertise and their degree in engineering. Uh, let me introduce you to a few people sitting here with me and we also have a few people tuning in online. Uh, let me tell you who we have here. Uh, right next to me, we, let me start with the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Professor Liesel van Dijk. Liesel, thank you so much for availing yourself at night now even. Uh, you work full-time through the day, and now even at night you have to sit here and talk to us. We really appreciate it. I hope my, my boss also see that we... Uh... <laughs> but aren't you the boss? So, oh, I'm we, the we boss all... here. <laughs> <laughs> we all it, have a boss. All right, thank you so much for being here. We're going to hear all from uh, the Dean uh, regarding her knowledge of the faculty and how the faculty is being run and where it's positioned and so on. Uh, and then we have a few experts here focusing on the solar car. Now, we're focusing on the solar car because it's, it's such a nice project where all the different areas of, of engineering, all the different subjects, all the different focus areas actually latch on to the project and they contribute in some other way. Let me start with one of the lecturers here uh, in the Faculty of Engineering. He's from the School of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering, Christo van der Merwe. It's so nice to have you here as well. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Nice Christo, we'll, we'll get to your school a little bit later on uh, because it's a fascinating thing. I, 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 you often get asked most probably the question, uh, electrical and electronic, what's the difference? And then how does it latch on to computer? So if that's the sort of thing that you're interested in, we'll get to that a little bit later mm -hmm. on. All right, Christy, I'll come to you in a moment now because uh, Christy is heavily involved in the, uh, the solar car and so on. He also, yesterday and so on, we had tours on campus, lovely campus to come and visit. He took everybody all around for a tour. He does that. I don't know if he takes them to Kruger Park as well. We'll, we'll <laughs> ask him later on. And then we have two gentlemen here, uh, students, ladies and gentlemen. So we have Tristan Melmont. Tristan, thank you so much for being here and allowing us to pull you away from your studies because you, you were most probably lined up for some serious studying tonight. Yeah, well, sometimes it's definitely the studying goes on until late in the night. So <laughs> but not tonight. Not tonight. Tonight no, I made a bit of time for you and it's nice to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. And then we also have Joshua Plykis. 
thank you so much for being here. We I also spoke to Joshua a little bit yesterday. He's a fascinating guy. Jo Joshua, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you. Now the, these two gents are are both uh, students in 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 which which mechanical degree? engineering mechanical, mechanical engineering yes. both of you both of us all yes. right so we we'll get to that a little bit later okay. on as well all right now uh, also online uh, uh, visiting us tonight uh, from I don't know where you are uh, Reynard if you're at the office still or at home but we have Reynard de Pria Reynard uh, welcome it's nice to have you here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, yeah, hello from a sunny Croatia. Uh, I'm currently in, in Zagreb. Um, yeah, on a little bit of vacation, but thank you much for having me. Oh my goodness, Croatia, I tell you. Uh, it's, it's really nice to have you here. Thank you so much. It's, uh, uh, we're going to hear from you about the company that you work with because I hear you build fast cars, right? So we'll get to that a little bit later on as well as your work on the solar car in the past. All right. Uh, Professor, let's start. Just just give us uh, an idea of where is the faculty within the campuses and the setup of the Northwest University. Where do people come to when they study engineering at the Northwest University? Okay, so our faculty is, is one of eight faculties, um, and we have three campuses. But the Faculty of Engineering is specifically positioned in Potchefstroom. Um, and um, you, there's also a lot of our modules, a lot of our curriculum that is intertwined with the Natural and Agricultural Sciences Faculty. And, and you have uh, how many five schools here? Four? Uh, we have five schools and, and a total seven programs within those schools. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's a four-year degree people start off with normally? Yeah, the curriculum is designed to be a four-year degree. Um, it, it's, it's not uncommon to take more than four years, but um, it's designed as a four-year degree. Mm. So that must put you at ease, gentlemen. I don't know, you are both fourth years right now. Yeah, uh, I actually finished my degree in five years, but I'm currently busy with my master's degree. Oh my goodness, so you just don't stop. Five years, no, not it's... enough, and you just continue. Yeah, it's, well, it's so fun. I mean, why stop so easily? <laughs> <laughs> Tristan, I feel bad now about getting him away from his books now. <laughs> master's. All right, so uh, let's start and talk a little bit about the... We'll come back to the faculty just now, but I want to get to the solar car. Uh, Christu, tell us, uh, where are we now? I, there, there are a few numbers going about. There's a, the 10th the year in which you compete or something, and then there's a 2.0 thing, and then it's a, a second car, fourth version. Tell us a little bit about the, the solar car. Okay, I just want to clarify something. I'm a big fan of the solar car. I'm not heavily involved but I'm um, drinking tea and coffee every day with people that's quite involved. So the technology uh, around the solar car is this thing that really, really fascinates me. And as he says, once you go down the rabbit hole to see what they are tweaking inside that car, it's just amazing mm. to see where we started off, which was a, a decent uh, effort, and where we are now and the specialities that we we, we brought in and the people from this university and each one with his expert knowledge, zooming in on a small piece and just looking to shave off a few grams here and a few grams there and to get this car where it is today. Mm. It's just, it's amazing. So mm. I, can, um, I can tell you something about the technology inside and details yeah, regarding please. that. I mean, let's just start, you, you mentioned uh, it's it's not a, not a new thing now. It's been coming for a number of years. How yes, many years yes. now? But is it, oh, is it about ten years? How, how long? I think it's more than ten years how, since how we long started. We've we been busy with this. Uh, so, officially, the solo guy has existed for ten years now. Officially, yes. but you've been working on it for more than ten. Yes. Okay. Now, look, we've missed some of the competitions, if I have it correct, as well. Mm. And um, but we started out with the first one, which was called the Batmobile. I don't know if they remember <laughs> yeah. that, Batmobile. which was the nickname that they got at the competition. It was a huge thing. Yes, and it, it really looked like Batman's mobile. So, <laughs> <laughs> and today we have this marvelous the Lady 2.0, as you've seen, and did you drive it? No, I, I wanted to get in, but I, Joshua was there, and he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> so I just wanted to go and say, don't touch the car. <laughs> yeah, it's quite an experience. My um, little girl, when I showed that to her, she had a look at the car, and we were fascinated with the unveiling of it. And mm. she said, she had a look at it, and she said, 
where do you put the groceries? <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's, it's important to know that that car is not designed for, for comfort, but mm. it's more for performance. Yeah. And um, they tested the car. That's something amazing. The past uh, I think a week or two ago, they tested the car and they encountered some problems. And uh, one of the motors just it was destroyed due to settings. And the team managed to put that car to back together within 24 hours wow. and um, they raced again. So I yeah. think that is something, the spirit and the, the, the I want to say, the camaraderie of the people involved in that solo car. It's just amazing. Because mm. it's, it's good to, to drive the solo car if everything's working. But what if it falls apart? Mm. Then you have to be able yeah, to repair yeah. it and get back online. Yeah. So. Now, Christa, let me just say hello to Anda and Leanne. I see you and uh, thank you for your comments. Look forward to engaging with you a little bit more. Christa, before I get to the students who, uh, you know, they live close to the car as well, um, uh, you mentioned the, the, the complexity of it, the, the engineering that goes into it. Now, when I saw the car, uh, I only saw the outside, so I saw how beautiful it was beautifully lined up and aerodynamic and everything, you know, but, uh, but they didn't open up the engine, as it were. Uh, tell us a little bit about more about what's going on underneath the covers. Okay, um, so most people familiar with solar energy would know that somehow you need to capture that solar energy, and that's, of course, the, the panels that you see on the outside, which is the things that they are holy about. Don't, please don't yeah. touch the panels. because it looks like a massive they, table. And so yeah, and they're fragile, to... and they're yeah. very, very expensive. So then you take the energy from the panels, and by some means you have to do two things. You have to store it, and you have to use the energy to drive a car. Mm. So there you have all complex systems measuring the voltages and the currents, and logging those values, measuring the temperature of the battery. Mm. So the battery itself has a whole, they call it a BMS, a battery management system, which will control the charging and the discharging of the battery. And then you also have to look at the motor, uh, the current and the voltages involved with driving the motor to make sure you don't overdrive it and mm. cause damage. Um, along with that, all these units need to communicate. So you have a communications bus to um, swap out the data and get everything at one point. So the people on the outside also has this information available to do the planning. Yeah. Because it's, as you'll hear through the evening, you have to decide when to drive and when to uh, speed up and when to slow down. What's that song? Um, there's a, so there's song. a song about that. <laughs> yeah, I can't get the words now, but um, you have to look at the weather patterns and all those things. So it's a lot of data coming yeah. together in order to control the flow of energy. Yeah. So it's a wonderful example of how the world of computer electronic and electric electronic comes together. The, the whole information thing and the energy thing. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's really a great project. And I think the guys involved in that will also attest to that. Yeah. Uh, we're giving our age away. You're going to gotta speed it up. That's it. <laughs> Who was that? Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't know the song. Yeah, But you know the car. Are you, how, how are you involved? Let's start with Joshua. How are you involved? Okay. Uh, my name is Joshua Plakis. Finally, I'm mechanical engineering. Uh, I came to the university in 2014. Uh, maybe I took the, what do you call the slow room of the university where you were uh, grad cream with lekker cream. I took it a little bit too, <laughs> I took it a little bit too seriously, but... I dropped out uh, in 2018. Uh, when you go outside, that's when you see how much you need a mechanical yeah. engineering degree, especially when COVID hit and all of those things. Yeah. Uh, I phoned Mr. Danny about, I think, last year when I was still trying to get into university, I phoned Mr. Danny mm -hmm. and asked him if I can come work for him. He said, uh, not this year, but just wait a moment and maybe I'll see if I have something for you in yeah. the beginning of the year. He gave me a call and I was so happy. Who's this now, Donny Yeffer? Mr. Donny Yeman. Oh, Donny Yeman. He, yes, he's the team manager of the solar cars. This, oh, this okay. Year. Yes. And he gave us an opportunity to learn and I'm not, uh, I'm very happy for this opportunity. I'm thank you. Yeah. It's like it improved my, even now we have some models in our final year. Uh, we're already doing it there. Yeah, yeah, because I... So you're I, already getting the practice I, before you have to I, I looked into your workshops, and it's mm. a massive thing. It's, an, it's, a, it's a huge building to work in. 
with all the equipment that you need to do your work. It's, it's, it's well equipped. Yes, it's very well equipped. Yeah. Especially if you look at uh, just the things that are around there. I think on the left hand side, we have the sailplanes from Mr. Yonker, how yeah, they started yeah. back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And we have all of the, I think three of the other cars were still there. Two of okay. the, other, the other four cars were still there. Yeah. So you can see how the project came along, all of them, mm. the engineering problems and, and how we can go forward from yeah. here. Tristan, and, and you, how were you involved? Well, I, I was actually lucky enough to, um, well, when I was busy with my final year, uh, one of the uh, things you need to do is you need to do vacation work. We have to work for about four weeks mm. um, at, in an engineering institution of some sort to get enough experience to go on. And um, obviously it needs to be in the whatever you studied, I mean, yes, whatever kind of engineering yeah. you studied. Yes, and then um, when uh, well, I was planning on uh, completing it in the mid-year yeah. uh, vacation, but then COVID it, so all the companies were closed. And then at the end of the year, Mr. Sorrell um, called me and he asked, can you still pass this year if you can complete this? And I said yes, and he suggested that, or he actually gave me the opportunity to do my vacation work on the solar car, which is how I met, met Mr. Iman and um, through that also uh, Dr. Bosman, mm. who gave me the opportunity to do my master's degree with him. Yeah. Um, so it was just, everything just came together. So if I work out the dates now, you must be one of the first students who spent Christmas with the solar car. Very close to Christmas, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was close to Christmas. Uh, till yeah. I was busy working on the solar car till the last day when the campus closed. Yeah, I don't know, Tristan. It sounds good, but also a bit sad. We must work on your next Christmas a little bit. <laughs> Give you a bit more freedom, oh, right? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, let me move to Reynard. Reynard, uh, 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 first of all, tell me, why are you where you are? Uh, uh, why aren't you here with us? Um, well, I'm currently working in Croatia. Uh, after I was involved in the solar car, um, I just fell in love with the automotive industry and I decided to pursue a career in the automotive industry. And I was lucky enough to uh, find a, a work in a company that does not only automotive, but electrical automotive as well. So, um, yeah, I'm currently working for uh, Rimas Technology. Uh, we are it's a company that supplies uh, battery systems and electrical powertrains for uh, not just our sister company Bugatti Rimac, but also for uh, large OEMs like BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, the whole BW group, uh, Ferrari, Lamborghini, all those type of uh, uh, OEMs around Europe mainly. And yeah, I've, I've just uh, grown into the field and uh, loving every second of it. Reynard, I've been told to ask a little bit about speed. Uh, but, but talk to me about speed on two levels. It's the speed that you are involved with now uh, and, and then your experience in terms of speed in the solar car. Um, okay, I'll start with where we are now. So uh, our first production or second production car that we're currently working on is called the Rimas Navera. Uh, it's currently the most powerful production car in the world. Uh, it's also the fastest accelerating car in the world. So we recently broke a record in the USA where we did a zero to 100 in 1.58 seconds. And we completed the quarter mile in 8.5 seconds. Uh, and then we do top speeds of around 420 kilometers an hour. Um, yeah, so that's on a, on a much larger scale. So we're working with uh, the pinnacle of hypercars in the world currently. Yeah, now that's way too fast, Rainer. Aren't you? Do you actually drive? Do you just do the engineering? Do, do they put you behind the wheel? Uh, I've been lucky enough to experience the car. Yes, uh, we've got <laughs> trained drivers. Uh, I'm not way close to good enough to to, dr to drive those cars by myself. Yeah, uh, but I've been lucky enough to be driven in one and to drive it at, at normal speeds. Uh, but I'm more focused on the engineering, so I'm currently working in the battery systems division, uh, where yeah, we, we mainly develop, design and manufacture batteries for our own cars and other OEMs. I don't know, Reynard, it sounds more like a plane to me, but anyway, it's a fast car. But you, you mentioned that you started out here at the university working on the solar car, right? Yes, uh, I, I joined the solar car program in 2013 uh, when, when we started uh, transitioning from Batmobile to, to serious 
And uh, yeah, I was uh, involved in taking the lessons learned from, from the Batmobile and applying that to, to Sirius. Uh, yeah, we were back then a team of eight students um, that was, was working on it. And we, I mean, we, we were electrical and mechanical guys mainly. And yeah, we really had the opportunity to uh, grow into each other's fields and to learn from each other's fields and uh, get experience that I don't think uh, is always possible uh, through other university programs. Uh, that's why the solar car is such a great project. And yeah, I, I was on, on the project through the 2014 Sasol Solar Challenge. And I was also part of the, the team that uh, went to Australia to compete in, to be the first team to complete the, the World Solar Challenge in 2015. Mm. Reynard, uh, just one last question uh, I, I want to pose to you. Uh, and that is, uh, um, you know, students often underestimate the value of being involved in what seems to be a smallish uh, project and how it just impacts on your life. Uh, I mean, look at where you are now, right? It, it's a small beginning, but it adds up to something uh, that's, that's almost like a calling that you live out. Definitely. Um, I would say what the solo car taught me uh, on a project level was understanding how to work with different uh, other engineering disciplines, um, getting to know what the guys do, how to integrate everything, uh, how everything goes uh, goes from point A to point B or from start to finish, uh, taking into account uh, other disciplines like mechanical when you're doing the electrical design uh, and how to work together to get the most optimal design possible. And then beyond that, it, it would be going uh, from, I would say 95 to 100% uh, that completion rate, finding that, that half a percent that, that puts you ahead of anybody else. Uh, you, you really need trust in your team and you really need a, a good understanding of what other disciplines' uh, involvement is in, in the whole project as well. Reynard Priya, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, if ever you need help, uh, not, not so with the engineering, but just in remembering South Africa and, and how to braai, uh, we can help. We'll come over. You are always welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, gents, I want to uh, close off with you uh, before I get to the faculty again. And that is, what's next for the solar car? Do you have room for improvement? Uh, uh, what would you like to add to it? I mean, if you're moving and thinking towards next year and the year after that. Uh, well, Tristan? Well, currently, well, actually, um, in the last year, last year we did a massive amount of upgrades, which slashed the weight of the solar car to... Uh, we did a weigh-in in the race a couple of weeks ago, and it weighs in a total without the driver of 165 kilograms mm -hmm. uh, with the battery pack and everything. Um, but currently we are working on acquiring new cells for the battery pack for a battery pack rebuild, as the battery does tend to degrade over time. Um, that's one of the disadvantages of lithium batteries. Mm. Uh, so we're busy working on rebuilding it before the next race. Um, and otherwise than that, it's... A lot of small things now until um, there's an Aledi 3 coming probably in a couple of years' time. Mm. But until then, it's small increments that gives you those little percentages that mm. just gives you um, an advantage when you're driving in a massive uh, competition over a couple of days, mm. like the Sasol Solar Challenge, which is from Johannesburg all the way to Cape Town. Mm. But he speaks like an engineer, right? Tweaking the efficiencies <laughs> and the effectiveness of the system. Joshua, you're not looking for a new driver. Or, or what? So it's, it, the, what's the human element? Uh, there will always be students, I guess, involved in the solar car. Uh, that's our hope for the university because it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for students to learn, especially even master students, final year students. It's a great opportunity. So uh, talking about the improvements and the things that I do think there's, there's, a, there's a few things that I think the next couple of students can come work on mm. that uh, I think some of them, he touched already on it. Yeah. I think the aerodynamics and things like that. Mm. Uh, we, uh, the electrical, as Reynard, uh, the electrical systems, there's always room for improvement there. Yeah. So, yes, I hope, uh, optimistic for the future. Yeah. Yes. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in tonight. Uh, academic staff members, we're going to cover the entire faculty from now on. We're going to talk a little bit more about the, the solar car. 
before we launch into a bit of an overview of the faculty, we, we have a video that we're going to show now. Uh, Prof, uh, what's, the, what's the first step? If you're interested, they, they're sitting here tonight and they're keen on, on studying engineering. Obviously, they'll learn more and so on, but what, what's the first step they need to take? Well, the first step to take is to um, pass your matric in <laughs> maths and science. Yeah. So, so that's the most important mm. thing is to work hard. And um, also, if you're in grade nine and you ne need to select your modules, that you select maths and science. That's the very first step. If you went through that step and you want to apply, um, my advice is to go to the website of the university, um, nw.ac.za, uh, but also have a look at our faculty's website, engineering.nw.ac.za. On our faculty's website, there will be clear links to persons that, that can help. So apply online, apply on the um, university website, but also, also please browse our website for the application staff that can help you with that. All right, thank you, Liesl. Christo, thank you so much uh, for being with us for this first section. session. Uh, let's have a look, ladies and gentlemen, at a bit of an overview of the Faculty of Engineering. There's a saying that money makes the world go round. We'd rather argue that engineers make the world go round. Welcome to your future. Welcome to the Faculty of Engineering, a place where we want to change the world for the better and develop exceptional engineers by creating an industry-relevant environment based on cutting-edge research and academic excellence. We are deeply vested in the progress of our students and we choose our students with great attention and care. We want our graduates to have a solid academic foundation, as well as practical applications experience within the world of work. A qualification in the field of engineering will prepare you to grow, thrive and succeed. What courses do we offer? Chemicals and Minerals Engineering Computer and Electronic Engineering Electrical and Electronic Engineering Electromechanical Engineering Mechatronic Engineering Mechanical Engineering Industrial Engineering Chemical and Minerals Engineering A chemical and minerals engineer is someone who is trained to develop, design and manage industrial processes where raw materials are converted to products with higher economic value. Chemical engineers can address and find solutions for many of the grand challenges faced in the world today, which include climate change, energy shortages, environmental and water concerns. Our undergraduates are trained in equipment design for chemical, minerals and enzymatic processes, system optimization and control, while incorporating health, safety and environmental regulations. Computer and Electronic Engineering A computer and electronic engineer is trained in the core building blocks of mathematics and physics to analyze and study the digital world of computer systems and the internet. They do this using electronics, embedded systems, programming skills and data analytics to enable business decision making and to build the Internet of Things. Electrical and Electronic Engineering an electrical and electronic engineer is trained to analyze and study electricity, electromagnetism and electronics. Using this core knowledge, problem solving, analytical thinking and effective design can be done on complicated systems. Our undergraduate students are trained in Generation, Management, Distribution, Design, Maintenance, Control and instrumentation of electrical and power generation systems. Electromechanical Engineering Electromechanical engineers bring the principles of electrical and mechanical engineering together. The main objectives of an electromechanical engineer is to manage and control the behavior of various energy transfer interfaces, which include electrical, mechanical processes and machinery within an industrial environment. Fundamental electrical and mechanical knowledge will enable the electromechanical engineer to effectively manage a multidisciplinary plant or factory 
on a practical level and will assist to govern health, safety and quality principles in the industrial working environment. Mechatronic Engineer Mechatronic engineers develop and support the advanced industrial automation systems of the future that make use of the Internet of Things. They accomplish this by combining knowledge of electronics, measurement and actuation, embedded systems and control theory to control mechanical structures and mechanisms. Their knowledge of computer programming and data analytics allow them to develop intelligent and effective mechatronic systems. Mechanical Engineering Mechanical engineering can be considered the application of the knowledge of physics, chemistry and mathematics to practically improve many aspects of life and resources. These engineers form part of teams needed to design, market and develop product or systems. Key focus areas can be expressed as defining problems or needs to ensure focused and effective engineering efforts, investigate equipment failure to enable better component and system design, development and testing of designed prototypes, understanding and dictating steps used in the manufacture of components, understanding the full life cycle of a product, component, system or plant to ensure that impact on the planet is minimized. Industrial Engineering Industrial engineers optimize systems by creatively designing solutions that integrate people, processes, technology and data. Industrial engineering originated more than a century ago during the Industrial Revolution, when industries started to search for the best, cheapest and fastest way to manufacture products. However, today it is imperative to employ industrial engineers in various industries due to the emerging challenges of the Industry 4.0 era and the current demand of the marketplace. Industrial engineers are responsible for various tasks such as analysis of data and problems, design of systems and processes, planning and optimizing of current systems and processes, management of operations, projects and maintenance activities, the integration of systems, processes, people and technology, improving overall efficiencies and profits in an organization. What are the minimum requirements? When you apply to enroll in an engineering program, you will need grade 12 exemption with a minimum of 70% for mathematics and physical science, a minimum of 60% for Afrikaans or English, and a APS score minimum of 34. Students with 50% in both mathematics and physical sciences may have the opportunity to write a test as additional point of entry or enroll for the Excel Bridging Program. Please visit for more information and applications. The Northwest University offers hands-on practical experience in on-campus laboratories for all disciplines of engineering. We function as a dynamic training hub for world-class, versatile and innovative engineers. As an engineer, you'll be highly skilled and equipped to take on the world's challenges. So my experience as a student at the Northwest University has been nothing but positive. Whenever I've needed assistance, I've found that my lecturers are always open and their doors are always open to any student at any time. And I've also found that the skills that I'm learning here will remain relevant for a very long time to come. The reason that I decided to study engineering was because I'm a person with vision and I need skills in order to bring my ideas to life. And that is exactly what I found here at the Faculty of Engineering. The one thing that I've learned at the Faculty of Engineering that I'm excited to implement in the real world is my problem solving skills. So as an engineering student, you are forced to work under time constraints and it is a challenge. And through that you grow and gain problem solving skills that will be able to benefit mankind one day. What is a computer and electronic engineer? It's an engineer who is trained in the core building blocks of mathematics and physics to analyze and study the digital world of computer systems and the internet. They do this using electronics, embedded systems, programming skills and data analytics to enable business decision making and to build the internet of things. What do we do? 
Computer and electronic engineers are trained in both areas of computer and electronic engineering with the ability to integrate methods and technologies across both disciplines. Their end-to-end -end design experience at the Northwest University makes computer and electronic engineers highly employable in various industries due to their analytical thinking, design thinking, and problem solving. Where can you work? Computer and electronic engineering provides you with various employment opportunities due to excellent training in problem solving skills and analytical thinking. Some opportunities include telecommunication, process control, aviation, banking sector, software development, consulting and management. Ladies and gentlemen, you're still with us. It's great to have you here. Uh, just a reminder, you are listening to and watching the Faculty of Engineering's Open Day here uh, online, all the way from Port of Stuham in the Northwest Province. So from wherever you are, we've had people in the first session from Croatia. So wherever you are, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, all you need to do is sign in with your Gmail account. You can offer us some comments and ask questions. We have the panel here. Uh, and people will be able to provide you with answers uh, if you have any burning issues that you'd like us to address. Now, as you've seen in the videos now, we're moving on to uh, one of the schools in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, and we're focusing on electrical, electronic, and computer engineering. Uh, my first question, ladies and gentlemen, was why? <laughs> why they have the three of them together in, in one school? So I'm very fortunate to have the program manager here tonight uh, of computer and electronic and, uh, uh, and electrical engineering, Henry Marais. Henry, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, you see a few other people here as well, but first, let's start with, with Henry. So Henry, my question is why? Why the three of them together? Do they... It, obviously, they all they have some electronic thing going, you know. Yes, there's a commonality. Yeah. Um, primarily being electronic in nature, so anything that's to do with either electricity, so the the heavy current things powering our world, or the smaller signal stuff like electronics and sensors, um, those things are sort of the common thread between the three programs. So you've got the electrical and the electronic engineering, that's sort of the heavy current stuff, ESCOM and nuclear power, that sort of Huge thing. Huge power lines. Huge power so, lines, yeah. the, the, the really heavy stuff, yeah. yeah. Then you've got the sort of in the middle, the mechatronics grouping, and those are the guys who control the physical world or make things move. Mm. So there's some mechanics, but it's primarily computerized control of things. And then on the other end of that, you've got the computer engineering guys who deal with sensor information and wireless transmission and all of that sort of stuff. Mm. So you've got a sort of shrinking down of the size of the stuff as you go from yeah. the electrical one through to the mechatronics. So that so, in a nutshell would sort of... And I'm, I'm aware about asking this, but obviously there's a huge demand in South Africa for, for your students. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a growing area I mean, globally as well, but we are experiencing it in our homes. Uh, in South Africa, there's a huge demand. There's a massive demand. Um, and it's, as you said, not just a demand locally, but a demand internationally as well. Mm. Um, so a lot of our students that graduate end up um, working overseas, mm. some of them immediately so. Um, so even, even in terms of South Africa's power supply to other countries and so on, this would be an area, you know, how do you get those lines fixed and power over there and to another country or whatever? That's part of it. Um, yeah. Increasingly, we find that renewable energy sort of plays into it, um, yeah. and then obviously, sort of the geographic nature of where you are yeah. um, factors into it. So, solar panels at the coast is probably not as good an idea um, as as PV panels in the Northern Cape, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. And that's sort of the kind of issues that the the students in electrical engineering would grapple with, um, amongst other sort of more technical things like yeah. what the quality of the power is. So, not just my light lights up, but you know what's the level or quality of energy supply to them. Yeah, and also a four-year qualification at first before four they years. go postgraduate. Yeah, so it's four years. Um, the postgrad thing is perhaps we need to clarify that a bit. So it's a four-year B-Eng degree. So essentially you skip the honours degree. So after your four-year degree, you can enter into a master's immediately. Uh -huh. um, so it's somewhat postgrad immediately since it's yeah. a B degree and not a not a BSc which requires and then it's an followed honors. by the higher degrees a little bit later. Yes, and then higher degrees is a master's, typically two years, and after a master's PhDs, which 
hopefully runs about three years. Yeah. Now, Henry, we'll, we'll come back to you a little bit later on. Ladies and gentlemen, you've most probably seen Yane here. Uh, she is a third year student, so, so she's caught up in the eye of the storm. We're going to give her an opportunity to reflect on where she is in her life <laughs> now with, with her study. So, you know, we'll, we'll come to you in a, in, a, in a bit. Let's start with the focus on the, on the computer part of it. Because I'm also curious as to what are we talking about? Is it is it as small as as a laptop or a desktop, or or, or where are we heading with with the computer part uh, of it? And we have Christopher Namava here, ladies and gentlemen. He's a a, a lecturer in in the school. Uh, Christu, uh, welcome. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the focus on on the computer part. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, you have to stop me because there's a lot to, to talk about. And uh, Henry and I, we can get passionate about this. Um, what, just a brief overview of the history. In the past, the first computers were analog of nature. So people literally built controllers by using solder. And they constructed the circuit and it could do something, some dedicated task. That was just electronic. So you were That's an electronic started. Yes, yeah. you were an electronic engineer. That's what you can do. And the only person able to make that thing do something is an electronic engineer or someone with a, a electrical background. And then they figured out a way so anyone can program that piece of hardware. And that's when computers really started. So instead of rebuilding the whole circuit, you can just write the program which can interpret uh, or the, the hardware can interpret that program and perform a specific function, and then you can just change the program. You don't need to rewire the whole thing. So that is where the computer part started infiltrating the electronics, and that's where it got really interesting. Mm. Um, and we have a term, they call it embedded engineering, and that is really where you have to do with computers. That's not really a computer. The microphone that you're wearing is not just a simple analog uh, amplifier. It has a computer inside, an embedded microcontroller, yeah. which will look at the battery, it will charge the battery, it will look at the signal levels, it will adjust it, do some intelligent uh, decisions and all those things. Mm. So 99.9% .9 of the computers in the world are of this type of computer. Mm -hmm. So if you count laptops and all those things, that is just the tip of the iceberg, uh -huh. if you look at uh, computing and the, the computers that you have. Mm. So it basically infiltrated, and that is why we don't have electrical engineering and electronics anymore. We have computer electronics, because the computers became part of that. And it's even moving closer. Now the electronics and the computers are even moving closer to the electrical part. And Jan Hendrik will tell you more about that. Because in the old days, guys said, no, I don't like electronics and small things. I'm going with the thick wires and the low resistances and the high voltages and the high currents. Mm. That's what I like. And these things moved so close together. And that's also why we have the three disciplines. Mm. But, but doesn't it make it difficult to compile a curriculum? I mean, when people are interested in this, it, it's okay. But it, it sounds as if they're studying something that these days it's everywhere. It's in every appliance, it's in every uh, electronic system. So uh, how do you bring about focus? What do you actually teach them then? It's extremely difficult. Um, Henry can also tell you more about that, but yeah. the half-life of the knowledge is more or less 18 months. And Moore's law says, well, you can double the technology within 18 months. Oh so it goodness. means if you learn something today, 18 months, it's obsolete. Yeah. So you, if you're an engineering student, especially in our school, or the, the electronic computer and electrical, you will never stop learning. Because the time that you think you are an expert, you're actually on Mount it's Stupid. Already data. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you realize that you don't know anything. Yeah. And you go on to that trajectory. So yeah. it's very difficult, but we tend to focus on the basics. The basics yeah. will never change. Yeah. And, basic um, laws and so on. No, yes, of, the physics and the maths, all those yeah. things you out there hate. So <laughs> we teach you that and show you how to actually make sense of the world using those tools of yeah. maths and science. Um, but yes, the, the, the things on top, I mean, if we think of something like um, Internet of Things, that wasn't even a term a few years ago. Now it dominates everything. Yeah. 3D printing, I mean, the, the technology involved, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, 
Six years ago, those things didn't even exist. Raspberry Pis? Yes, you know Raspberry Pis? No, no, no. I, did, I a, know the more traditional one. <laughs> oh, we'll have to show you one. It's a, it's it, a pocket-sized computer. Yeah. It's more powerful than the things that they've used to uh, put the rockets on the moon. But, but Henry, how do, you, how do you compensate for this in a curriculum then? When you, when you come and study, uh, you study something that's really moving so fast. You, you have to spend four years here. You have to spend four years, um, as we mentioned earlier. So the way to sort of get around this half-life problem that Christy mentioned is we don't get stuck in technology. So when you end up studying with us, it's not a case of we're going to teach you an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. It's we'll teach you about 8-bit microcontrollers or 16-bit microcontrollers or 32-bit microcontrollers. Mm -hmm. Since that, those classes of devices, they don't really change. The way in which you think about programming an embedded system, for instance, depend, let's say you want to control, fly an aircraft flight. So the way in which you think about controlling the aircraft flight dynamics, mm. that's not tied to technology. Yes, you use technology to implement, and that underlying technology continues to evolve quite rapidly. Yeah. But the fundamentals stay the same. Yeah. So our primary focus is to get you really good at sort of doing the fundamental stuff excellently well, and then Technology, well, you're an engineer, so you should be able to deal with the technology. So throughout the four years, all of the practical aspects has this sort of get your sort of toes dipped into playing with the technology. Mm. And in the more senior level courses, there's a large element of unknown technology. So you will have integrative aspects, which will require you to go and study the technology on your own, mm. independently so. Um, and that's not sort of being nasty, that's actually one of the requirements of the professional body that says, well, as an engineer, you should be able to teach yourself continually. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of rolled into the curriculum as well. So we're going to have a look at another video explaining something uh, from the school. Uh, but I just want to say, Yana, you've, you've experienced this. This yes. As a student, you live this. Yes. So yeah. from your third year, you really um, look into more um, difficult stuff more unknown stuff and you mm. get to learn as you go and it's quite interesting and you feel very accomplished when you master the stuff so you are, you just take your skills that you've learned the previous years mm. and you apply it and it's very much self-study and yeah yeah all right ladies and gentlemen when we return uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about electrical engineering and something called mechatronic engineering uh, check out this video What is an electrical and electronic engineer? It's an engineer who is trained in the core building blocks of mathematics and physics to analyze and study electricity, electromagnetism and electronics. Using this core knowledge, problem solving, analytical thinking and effective design can be done on complicated systems. What do we do? Electrical and electronic engineers are trained in both areas of electrical and electronic engineering with the ability to integrate methods and technologies across both disciplines. Our undergraduates are trained in generation, management, distribution, design, maintenance, control and instrumentation of electrical and power generation systems. Specific focus is on effects of renewable generation, quality of supply, network stability and network protection. Where can you work? Electrical and electronic engineering provides you with various employment opportunities due to excellent training in problem solving skills and analytical thinking. Some opportunities include large-scale electricity transmission systems and power transmission, power generation and power system management, design of household appliances, lightning and wiring of buildings, telecommunication systems, consulting and management, and renewable energy. Facilities on campus. We offer hands-on practical experience in the labs on campus in both the electric, high voltage and electronic low voltage side. Experienced personnel will teach and assist students throughout the undergraduate years.
it's a, it's a massively interesting world. I tell you, it's as if you, we don't have enough time to talk about all of it. Let's let's jump straight into electrical engineering, right? Do I do I have that right? Yes. So Jan Hendrik Smith, a, a, a lecturer here at at the school, uh, tell us a little bit more about your field. What what is in so time? my field in terms of personal field is more in process monitoring, um, but I also focus on the part of, of heavy current. Like Henry said earlier, um, we try to distinguish between smaller devices and mm -hmm. heavy current systems. So heavy current is typically what we say electrical engineering entails. Mm. Um, so from past experience with talks to, to, to students, um, I know that it can sometimes be confusing when you say heavy currents, but with heavy currents, we typically refer to things that can actually choke you and can kill you if you yeah. do something wrong. Right. Um, so in that sense, that's what we mean with heavy currents. So we will typically look in South Africa um, one of the fields that's, that's really upcoming is the, the green energy field, uh -huh. um, which is something that I think most people know at the moment, um, and especially something that, that goes into the house. Um, so you get that uh, move over from things where you have electrical, uh, small electronics and stuff into the uh, heavy current field, um, because most inverters and green energy systems mm. is a heavy current system that's installed inside a house and that brings that electric, electronical part um, over to the, to the yeah. uh, heavy current part. And, and um, you've mentioned you're into process uh, uh, engineering as well. Yes. So uh, something like feeding back into the system, which uh, seems like a complex thing, but I mean, that's a typical process that you guys would be focusing on. Exactly. So when you look at process monitoring in general, um, it's the field of looking into is the system healthy or not, which entails also the efficient operation of systems and so mm. forth. So if you look at most engineering systems, um, in heavy current stuff, you need to know if they're actually doing what they're supposed to do and to what extent are they actually um, effective and efficient. Mm. Um, so you need to control that with smaller current systems like the electronic parts, but you need to know how the bigger things work. Mm. So there's high currents, high voltages, um, and all of the power electronic control on that side. So it, I mean, the, the move towards green energy is a massive, massive one. It's, yes. it's popular. Yeah. Is it a reapplication or reinvention of, of the tradition of your focus, or is it a move away and you have to... You I know, think it's a combination of both, um, in the sense that there is aspects that's reinvented. Um, I mean, we have quite big issues with grid stability and so on, if you look at uh, PVs and uh, green energy solutions. Mm. Um, so in that sense, there's a bunch of new things that's being developed, but the fundamental stuff is still the same. Mm. And I think that's what Henry also mentioned earlier when he said that we teach the fundamentals, mm. um, because those things will probably never change. Yeah. Um, physics is physics, and if you can stick to that, and you can teach a student how to think about it, then it can be applied over all of the fields that mm. there is. Um, so we it's, tend to try to do that. It's, it's future music, isn't it? And yes. we're living it now. There's, yeah. there's always a demand for people with qualifications in your field. Exactly. In fact, um, there's too much of a demand, uh, mm. especially in South Africa, but also um, overseas. Mm. Um, I'm, well, I finished my degree five years ago, and I don't know of any of my partners who struggled with, like my study mates, yeah. who struggled with getting work. Mm. Um, in fact, most of them were picked up within the first few, three or four months. Um, and there are some of them who already jumped two or three jobs because of the opportunities that they're yeah, yeah. Um, So they get good salaries, they have really nice stable jobs, even through the whole COVID thing, yeah. um, which is really great, especially if you think in South Africa where I think less than 5% of the people have a, P, uh, a degree afterwards mm -hmm. or a higher education. Yeah. So um, that yeah, gives you a wonderful. sense of how much um, need there is for, for people that can actually think. Well, I'm glad we um, pinned you down here tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that we have you here tonight, Jan Hedrick. Thank you so much. Uh, and also, um, uh, perhaps related, is the world of mechatronics. Uh, which we'll delve into uh, now uh, after watching this little video. We'll be with you soon. What is a mechatronic engineer? Mechatronic engineers develop and support the advanced industrial automation systems of the future that make use of the Internet of Things. They accomplish this by combining knowledge of mechanical structures and mechanisms, measurement and actuation, embedded systems and control theory. Their knowledge of computer programming and data analytics allow them to develop intelligent and effective mechatronic systems. Where can you work? 
A mechatronic engineering degree provides you with the opportunity to work within various automation industries due to excellent training and problem-solving skills and analytical thinking. Some opportunities include process control industry, automotive industry, manufacturing, agricultural processing environments. Facilities on campus. The Northwest University offers hands-on practical experience in the labs on campus in the electronic, computer and mechanical side. Experienced personnel will teach and assist students throughout their undergraduate years. Now this, for me, sounds like a movie. It's like they're studying a movie. Mechatronic engineering. Uh, what is that? That's, that's the first question. What is it, other than a movie? Where do we start? <laughs> I think Henry would be a good Henry? one. To... I'll, I'll venture into it. Um, it's not an and. Uh, so that, that's really important to sort of get your head around. So although mechatronics engineering sort of was born out of a combination of mechanical and electrical engineering. It's not an and, so it's not mechanical and electrical engineering. It's a beast of a different nature. I think that's the first thing to sort of get your head around, that it, it's a, if you put a computer engineer and a mechatronic engineer next to each other, they are different people. Yeah. Fundamentally though, a mechatronics engineer is a person who understands how to control uh, and manipulate the physical world based on computer control. So if you think about robotics that packs fruit into boxes, yeah. that's typically what your mechatronic engineer would do. Hollywood would tell you you're going to build a robot like an Iron Man suit <laughs> or that sort of thing, uh, but that's not quite realistic. So yeah. um, factory automation, uh, agricultural automation, all of the automation stuff around you is what mechatronic engineers deal with. Um, more tangible artifacts would probably be an elevator, uh, mm. escalator, the more... Uh, a boom gate, you know, most, yeah. most likely you've been into a parking structure where there was some boom gate. That, mm. All of those things are examples of mechatronic engineering. Yeah. But Janne Krier sitting right next to me, Janne, uh, did you know this? Yeah. You're studying mechatronic engineering. Did you know this when you started out? Um, so I'm one of the first group that's going to graduate with mechatronic engineering. So I first studied um, a year computer and electronic engineering. Mm. And then on my, in my second year, I went to mechatronic engineering. And I think you have an idea of what it's going to be, but you don't really know until you're there. But it's way more interesting and more com complex in, a, in an adventurous way yeah. than you first think. And you're a third year student, right? Yes. Uh, is it all work and no play? No, it's actually work while you play. It's very, very interesting and you learn and it becomes more of a hobby than actual studying. Yeah. Yeah. What, what interests you? I mean, of all the, the, the applications of studying within your degree uh, that Henry mentioned now, what, what do you see yourself doing? So at the moment, I'm very interested in design. I had a few vacation works where they threw me in the deep end and I needed to do some sort of design for them. And it's very interesting. It's a big combination of everything you learned and you learn a bit about a bit more about the mechanical domain and you see how all the engineering works together. So mm. it's very interesting. Yeah. What did you design? Um, so <laughs> I basically designed a glorified um, 3D, uh, 3D printer. So the movement of the X, Y and Z plane, I just increased large scale for them. Yeah, don't say basically, you just <laughs> said. it sounds massively interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and when you study, obviously there's some class time and then some practicals involved yeah. as well. Yeah. And how's, the, how's the, the weighting of the two? Is it class and practical 50-50 type of situation? So I think in your first two years it's more practical and uh, still pr um, oh, more theoretical, theoretical and a bit of practical yeah. because you s need to learn something before you can do something. Mm. But from your third year, it's a lot of practical, a lot more practical hands-on experience mm. and where you can um, apply the stuff you learned. So, yeah. so if you ever develop that Iron Man suit, <laughs> here's your first candidate. I'll try it out. Okay. Yeah, that's the kind of the level of trust <laughs> I have in you. Thank you. You know, thank you so much uh, for sharing your ideas with us. And uh, Henry, Christy, Janine, thank you so much 
uh, for availing yourself and telling us a little bit more about electrical, electronic and computer engineering. Really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, you are waiting for all the other schools and we're moving on to chemical engineering right after this. What is a chemical and minerals engineer? It's an engineer who is trained to develop, design and manage industrial processes where raw materials are converted to products with higher economic value. Chemical engineers can address and find solutions for many of the grand challenges faced in the world today which include climate change, energy storage, environmental and water concerns. What do we do? Chemical and minerals processing engineers are trained and equipped with skills for both the chemical and minerals processing industries. Our undergraduates are trained in equipment design for chemical, minerals and enzymatic processes, system optimization and control while incorporating health, safety and environmental regulations. Specific focus is on reaction kinetics, separation principles, plant design, and process control. Where can you work? Chemical and Minerals Engineering equips graduates with problem solving and analytical thinking skills which enables them to work in a number of sectors including, but not limited to, energy generation, food processing, brewing, wastewater treatment, pollution control, automotive industry, synthetic fuel manufacturing, minerals processing, and nanomaterials development for material science applications. Facilities on campus. We offer hands-on practical experience in the labs on campus focusing on microbiology, simulation of process design and control, brewing and roasting of coffee beans. My name is Felicity Bobadim. I am a lecturer and a PhD student at the School of Chemical and Minerals Engineering. Our chemical engineering program will train and equip you with problem solving and analytical thinking skills required to address and find solutions to challenges faced by the world, including climate change, energy shortage, environmental and water concerns, and also perhaps the COVID-19. Upon completion of your degree, you will be able to develop, design and manage industrial processes where you convert raw materials into products of high economic value, such as treating wastewater, converting coal to petrol, generating electricity and producing beer. Basically, wherever there is a process, a chemical engineer is needed. The knowledge and skills obtained from both theory and hands-on practicals offered on campus will enable you to work at different sectors like energy generation, food processing, brewing, wastewater treatment, pollution and automotive industry. Ladies and gentlemen, you're with the Faculty of Engineering and we're talking about a bit of chemistry in your life. Uh, chemical engineering. I have a, a whole range of people here that, that, and they're all going to tell us a little bit about their fields and what they're doing now and what they've experienced uh, studying chemical engineering. Uh, I know that uh, some of you have been waiting. Mohammed, thank you so much for your patience. Here we are with chemical engineering. Uh, I'd like to introduce the people here uh, with me in studio, uh, Marna Ernst. Marna Ernst over there, uh, she's a, a fourth year chemical engineering student, so she's so close to actually, you know, venturing out on her own, right Marna? So we'll, coming, uh, we'll be coming to you a little bit later on. Uh, and then we have Ntabiseng Liu Kauke. Uh, Ntabiseng, thank you so much for being here. Ntabiseng is a lecturer. Uh, although you seem to be a bit young, if I, if I can compliment you in that way. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll she, take it. She started at the age of 15 lecturing. <laughs> yeah. no, not, no, okay. Uh, but we'll hear from uh, the, the lecturer's side. She's a, a senior lecturer, and it's a, a wonderful privilege to have you here. And Tabi Singh, thank you so much. Oh, and I've been talking to Lesehu now for quite a while now. Lesehu is already busy with work and so on, and she took some time off, and she came to visit us in Pochestruum tonight. Lesehu Kibini, uh, she's a, a graduate intern 
from Impala Platinum Refineries. Did I get that right? Very clear, yes. Ah, Les thank you so much. We, we want to know all about your work, uh, in, including the exact salary that you take <laughs> on. No, 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 I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Les thank you so much. And then uh, Felicity in, in Tatisi, uh, she's an NGAP lecturer, so we'll ask her uh, uh, about that a little bit later on as well. But we're also very fortunate to be joined by a few people online. Uh, let me start off with uh, Humoto Mashamaite. Uh, Humoto, uh, production manager. Uh, welcome, it's so nice to have you here. Humoto, are you with us? Humoto? No, we'll just check the, com the connection there. Uh, uh, Johani Bize, uh, are you with us, Johani? I'm here. Uh, did I pronounce your name correctly, Ioani? It's it's Joni Bazet. <laughs> Joni Bazet. So I got it completely wrong. I thought so. That's why I'm oh, Joni Bazet. Uh, Joni, thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, technology development team member at Anglo American. It sounds like a bit of complexity in itself, uh, Joni. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for being here with us tonight. And then we have Denise van der Merwe. Uh, she's a postgraduate student. Um, and she, we asked her to come into the studio, but she said, no, she's studying. So we, say, we said we won't take up too much of your time. Denise, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. All right. Uh, Gomoto, I want to start with, uh, is, is Gomoto uh, there already? Did we sort out her connection? Gomoto, are you with us? No? Okay, Joni, let's start with you then. Joni, tell us a little bit about your, your world. We want to know what exactly is it that you're doing? What does it mean when you say you're a techn technology development team member? Yeah, so um, I started out at Anglo American as a graduate and um, I started out in the processing team, which is purely chemical engineering. And um, you would do what chemical engineers typically do, which is putting together processes, thinking about how do we develop processes and improving it. And then about two years ago, I got the opportunity to join the innovation team at Anglo-American. So what we do um, as technical development specialists um, at Anglo is we think big and we try to solve big problems, um, which may include anything around sustainability, making sure that our plants um, run as smoothly as possible. Um, and the innovation part really comes in where you think out of the box. So part of my daily work is thinking out of the box and looking at under other industries to see um, what can we pull out of the under other industries into the mining industry um, and where, where we can apply it, where it will have a good benefit for us. I'm going to ask Lesek as well, because I under, as I understand, you're also working in the mining sector, right? So if you, if you say you're doing pure chemical engineering right from the offset when you started out, uh, what does that mean? Is it, is it on a small scale? Because, you know, when I think of the mining industry, I'm thinking it's a, it's, it's a huge operation. Definitely. So I think in the mining industry, we have so many different types of engineers. Um, that have studied chemical engineering um, and that, that all find a bit of a place in the sector. So we have metallurgists, which are chemical engineers who specialize in um, extracting valuable minerals from ore bodies. Um, we have research and development engineers who work on a smaller scale, who won't necessarily work um, on a full scale plant. Um, and they do the lab work and then they carry whatever they learn in the lab over to the full scale plant. Um, we have chemical engineers that work as, as project engineers. Um, they manage the projects um, and they make sure everything comes together and, and are delivered on time. Um, so it, it really is a, 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 a it, it offers you a vast opportunity um, to kind of go find your interest and see where you fit in. But, but didn't you make a start when you studied here at the Northwest University? Didn't you make a start with the uh, solar car? Weren't you also involved there? Sorry, um, can you repeat that? I, I said, weren't, <laughs> I weren't you? The, the... Didn't you make a start when you studied at the Northwest University? Didn't you make a start 
Or did, didn't you have an involvement somewhere in the solar car? Yeah, so um, interesting to have a chemical engineer working on the yeah. solar car because that's not typically where we fit in. Yeah, that's why but, I asked. Um, <laughs> but I was, the, I was one of the team that was lucky enough to go with the previous um, cohort of engineers um, to Australia to take part in the Bridgestone World Solar Challenge. Um, I didn't do an engineering job there. I was the logistics manager. So I made sure that everything from packing the food to getting the solar car to Australia to sorting out the team members um, and making sure that they are happy was sorted. Um, and I think what it taught me is that, that you have all these technical people and all these engineers and they, they need their support systems to be happy. So um, I think if we, if we bring that back to mining and where I work, um, we have a lot of support structures like our HR, our finance people, um, and they're really also important to make sure that, that we as engineers can do our jobs at, um, on site and in the office. Thanks, Joni. She paints a, paints a picture of a well-rounded student, you know. It's not just the, the chemical engineering and standing in, in front of, you know, fluids and chemicals and so on. There's a bit of both going on, uh, and, and that's what you get from studying here. Yes, definitely. Uh, Is that your experience as well? <laughs> yes, that's definitely my experience. So when I was studying here, my um, student life, was just uh, centered around me studying, and <laughs> at then first. <laughs> <laughs> at first, <laughs> but then there must also be like a balance. Yeah. Even with all the studying, you must be able to um, fit in some having fun and all yeah. those things. So there's always that balance. Um, uh, definitely, you will do it. Mm. So with your 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 uh, studying and then fun, just the correct um, correct amount of fun, then you will definitely yeah. do it. Yeah. Now, you are at Impala now. Yes, I'm at Impala um, Platinum Refineries. Yeah. Yes. And what is it that you do there? So, I'm currently a graduate intern at Impala Platinum Refineries. So, on a daily basis, um, I work in operations. So, as a chemical engineer, uh, we just make sure that the plant is running smoothly. Um, we don't have bottlenecks, so we work... Um, a lot with people in other uh, disciplines. So I'll be just uh, doing plant walkabouts and then do, checking if everything is running smoothly. And then if anything is not um, operating the way it should, then I just uh, talk to the relevant people and then make sure that um, things are taken care of. So yeah. it's not just me being in the plant and doing all those things. Uh, there's a whole lot that's going on in the background. Yeah. So yeah. So it's 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 monitoring, but you're getting your steps in. Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, uh, so I work uh, a lot with people in 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 process. Yes. So I'll be working a lot with your process controllers, uh, just making sure that you have that very smooth uh, work relationship with every, everyone. Yes. Yeah. So it, it interests me in terms of saying, listening to the Seiko speak now, because um, you, you get the idea when you, when you hear chemical engineering, that is just chemistry. You know, I have a very funny story about that. Um, so seeing as I did start when I was 15, which was many <laughs> moons ago, um, basically what has happened is I had to research from an, an encyclopedia what a chemical engineer does. So I had a very big misconception um, of chemical engineering uh, when I was choosing my field way back when. Um, and then one day in my second year, I was told I had to go do vacation work on a plant. And I, I was lucky enough to go work at FreeSAM for six weeks. I got so dirty in those, <laughs> in those six <laughs> weeks. Uh, but I then learned it's actually a touch of chemistry but basically upscaling. So what we do is any raw material and you want to have a final product, we can step in and make that happen. Mm. Yeah. It's a, uh, and, and in terms of what they actually then study curriculum wise, what, what, it is, what are the typical modules that they'll have uh, first to fourth year? 
Okay, so we start off with uh, basic um, science information. So you're going to have your physics, you're going to have your chemistry and your mathematics. Then we go further into your, um, into your study where from your second year you start having more um, chemical engineering. So process principles start being introduced to you as a chemical engineering student. Um, and then eventually you're going to have the building blocks of a chemical engineering degree, which include your reaction, so reactivity. So there's going to be reactor theory. Then once these things have reacted, you have to somehow get your valuables and take your byproduct to the side. So there needs to be some form of separation that needs to take place. Um, and then to round it all off, there needs to be some form of environmental aspect that we put into this whole story, you know. So um, talking about water cleaning, um, and these are things we start to discuss in biotechnology. Uh, but before we send them off into the real world, and Marna will tell you, um, they have to do a big project where they actually combine their whole field of study. So they're going to do a research project and they're going to do a design project, and which are very good building blocks for yeah. a chemist. Is this in the fourth year now? That's in the fourth year. So it's still coming, Marna? It, she's busy. I'm currently busy with exactly <laughs> that. Um, I was just uh, earlier today busy with experiments Oh. for my final year's project and also to, uh, tomorrow evening we have a meeting for the design module so i'm um, i'm really busy but i enjoy it so. but but aren't you, are you third year or fourth year no, i'm a fourth year um, fourth year in the faculty uh, at uh, Potrostrum, the engineering is such as that you have four years but your mm. honors is included yeah that's so. a, basically the fourth year yes so, so um the four, fourth year is um your um design and final years. I don't know, Mana, perhaps your family is watching. How's it going with that final project? <laughs> Are you no, doing it's, well? It's, it's going well. <laughs> I, I, I'm currently busy um, with my literature review, which is due tonight. Yeah. So I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to do my final final editing after this. Yeah. Um, and then next week we start with the um, third chapter of the final year's project, so which is the module other um, methods and how we are going to analyze all the data that I'm um, collecting and so mm. on. So I'll, I'll come back to you a little bit later on to, to ask about that, that student life uh, that you are busy with yeah. now. Uh, but Felicity, there's, there's also something else within this school and it's called an NGAP. What, what is it? Well, NGAP is, well, by definition is the um, a new generation of academics program. So I'm hired as a full-time engineer, but I have the privilege of being in that program. It's actually run all over the, the country, actually. It's um, in another funded uh, position. So what the privilege that I get is to actually be allocated the first three years of my employment to focus on completing my PhD. Uh -huh. So I have like 20% of my, um, 100% of my time to focus on teaching and learning, and the 80% goes into me completing my PhD. Uh -huh. uh, I won't ask you how that's going, because <laughs> I know you, you broke it down as 2080, but I know it's more like 30, 150 percent, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what are you doing now? What are you focusing on? What, what, what's your interest in chemical engineering? So I am more on the, I don't want to get my hands dirty, field of chemical engineering, so I'm more on the focusing on the computer. So as Ntabi uh, Singh um, has already stated, when you are doing all your separation and with their final year the, uh, design project that they have, they have to focus on process model as well, or process control rather. So everything that is happening on the plant, me as the lazy person who doesn't want to go and do the walkabouts <laughs> on the plant, I sit in the, in the control room, look at the computer, and then I uh, automatically uh, control the plant from there. So if there's any valve that needs to be open, I can just tap it on my computer, it opens and flows and with water in or out or drain it or stop the entire process if mm. it needs to happen. Wh like what made you decide on... This is why I, this is what I want to do. I want to go into chemical engineering because obviously you're focusing on something uh, now that you didn't know when you started out. Yeah, well, I came here. I also thought I just need to be good in chemistry, which I was extremely good in high school. And then my first two years, I was it was amazing. And then I got to third year. Now I'm starting to look into. Okay, I don't know what's happening here, 
but I had my first uh, process control module in class. And I just thought this is actually something that I can do because I've realized that in all the processes that are happening, there needs to be some sort of control. Otherwise, we will be having some bomb reactions all over the country yeah. or in the world rather. So something, someone needs to keep an eye on how everything is happening and to also try to reduce the time it takes for us to actually walk out and close that valve or start that pump and whatnot. We need someone to just actually do that quickly from where they are sitting. Imagine if uh, we're saying we have, uh, there's a plant, you, we need water and there is a leakage at the water treatment plant and you have to wake up from your house and go close that valve. It means we're going to lose the entire water that is in the system. Yeah. So with process control, I can literally just open my computer and do it from my home. Yeah. Denise, uh, uh, I'm coming to you now because you're also a postgraduate student. You're doing your PhD, Felicity. Uh, Denise, what are you busy with now? What, which degree are you studying? I'm busy with my master's. Okay, first or, or how long have you been busy with it? And this is my third year. I'm doing it part-time this year. Okay, and what are you focusing on? Um, I'm focusing on vanadium redox flow batteries. The uh, what? Alternative energy storage solutions. Uh, explain it to Gierpio, who, who doesn't really quite get, get it. Um, well, basically, it's uh, um, make, um, alternative energy storage uh, in a major scale. Um, we, we have lithium-ion batteries that has a high density, but you can't really upscale it. So it's like an intermediate where you can store uh, uh, the solar energy and then um, um, making sure that you can peak shave and peak leveling. So the generation, um, it, um, it's the, that the demand would be lower. And yeah, so it's a big scale um, energy storage solution. Denise, but you must talk to the people with the solar car, man. They are looking for your skills because they, they also spoke um, about the battery and so on. Yeah, uh, I'm part, I was part of the solar car team, um, but unfortunately, um, lithium-ion batteries at this stage has the highest energy density. So for small-scale energy solutions, that's the best. Yeah. And, you know, but when you um, go upscaling for industrial or residential sectors, then um, making use of a nanometer metal spell batteries, that's well a better solution and a more probable one. Denise, what, what drove you into chemical engineering? What made you decide this is for me? Um, well, I've always been like an engineer at heart. Um, I know it's weird to say, but yeah, I've always found, found something that didn't work quite well. And then I just engineered it to and problem solved it and made it fit. Um, to do what I needed it to do. And then well, I also liked chemistry. I like my mother as a chemist. So I was I grew up with that. And uh, I sort of began to develop into a passion for me to design and develop solutions. And especially um, something that entails chemistry because I really, really love it. It's mm -hmm. for me, it's fascinating to just <laughs> the work of, of everything. And if everything is made out of atoms and chemistry and um, well, yeah, uh, if you can't understand that, you can't understand the basic functions and mechanisms that well entails life and everything around us. <laughs> it's fascinating. I, it, 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 it's as if each of you need to write your biographies because <laughs> Uh, uh, listening what drove you into this and, and how your path is structured uh, uh, up until where you are now, it's fascinating. And it leads me to asking, all right, so, so what's next? I mean, you are busy with uh, let, let me start with you because, I mean, you're not going to do what you're doing now forever. Uh, obviously, there's an end to the internship. Uh, what, where do you see yourself? Uh, when doing my program now at... Um, in Bala refineries, I grew some interest in process safety. This is something that's relevant to every um, industry. They want to work in the safest manner and they want to make their plants very safe. So I think I will be able to fit into every other industry, but I'm mostly interested in the 
mining industry. So I want to focus more on process safety management. So I want to see myself in that mm. space. Uh, Tabi Singh, I've heard safety, I've heard control, uh, and obviously as a, as a lecturer, that, that uh, situation is simulated. It's not, hey, let's see what happens, trial and error thing going. Um, are you talking from a lecturing point of view? Because from a lecturing point of view, we do train them in process safety. Um, we do also incorporate plant um, control with process mm -hmm. safety. Um, it's one of the things that Felicity just mentioned with regards to if you have a water leakage, you don't want to be wasteful. I mean, that's also another safety concern, but from a financial and an environmental aspect. Mm. So we do definitely prepare them when it comes to process safety and process control. Um, so I think she'll do great. Amara, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this might be a, a difficult question to ask with uh, that due date looming. Mm. Uh, tonight, but uh, uh, do you get th the chance to also just be a student and, and enjoy life? Definitely. Um, so my first year was no, pre-COVID, so in my first year I enjoyed, um, um, we enjoyed going out, we enjoyed um, being with friends, we were brawing, we did um, uh, uh, events on campus, we were really part of student life and then um, I remember the March before COVID started. We went to I went to my first play bride, and that's a that's a very famous thing to do in Portugal <laughs> as a student. And that was my first play bride. Um, and then the Monday or the Tuesday after that, we had to go home. And that's the main thing I missed actually when I was home. I missed the interactions between students, the, the student life we have at campus. Mm. Um, so yes, we do, we do really have time um, to be a student, but obviously um, academics must be first because that's the reason why we are here, to, yeah, yeah. to gain knowledge about the world we are placed in. And I, I spoke with Felicity earlier and she said, yes, uh, the impact on, on COVID was, was, of COVID was very bad, especially on a fly bride. <laughs> she's doing a fortnightly flay bride now. She's on a, on a program. No, I think I should start doing that as well. <laughs> uh, ladies, uh, uh, I would like to know what your advice is. Uh, you're sitting here and you're obviously successful and uh, we are talking to people um, who are keen on moving into your field. Uh, what, what is your advice? Let us start with uh, a journey. Uh, and then I'll give others the opportunity as well. Joni, what would you say to someone interested in what you, you are doing now? Mm, that's a difficult <laughs> one. <laughs> um, I would say stay true to yourself. Know what, what makes you tick in life and know what, what makes you enjoy yourself and, and what's fun for you. And um, for example, for me, it's problem solving. I love problem solving. Um, and that's why I think I make a good engineer. But I think if, if for anyone going into, into any career, um, at the end of the day, you just have to go decide, who am I? What do I want to do? And then pursue it with earnest, because I think then you will be truly happy in what you pursue. Jenny, I saw uh, uh, Felicity nodding her head in, in agreement, right? Yeah, definitely. 100%. But for me, I would say n just never give up. I mean, we all come from all different sorts of background. I am, for example, from the rural villages of Limpopo and look where I'm sitting now. Nothing has stopped me from going forward. I came here not knowing anyone in Porch and I am the first engineer, chemical engineer in my family, probably the first graduate as well. And I'm at a point where when I go home, literally everyone wants to find out for me what's happening. And it's actually very accelerating to say that you can inspire young kids. So never stop fighting for what you want in life. It's not just your family, it's also the NW family. Yes. Uh, proud of you. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Denise, uh, this must motivate you to completing that master's. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, what's your advice? Um, I, well, the others um, basically said it well. Yeah, just find a passion and keep moving forward. Just as well, um, just a bit background on my studies. I've hit a wall several of times 
um, and but every time you you figure out something new and you eventually you're going to solve that problem and you're going to push through and then one day I will we'll publish my <laughs> masters with an actual result so yeah um, whatever it is you're struggling with just keep on going because you will find a solution and you will be better for it so just I know it's going to be hard but just push through <laughs> yeah uh, and Toby saying uh, now uh, people are ready, they are keen, they are interested. What's the first step? What what do you think should they do now? They they are they are interested sitting at home somewhere in front of a screen, uh, and they want to take the the first step. What okay. is that first step? Okay, first step, uh, go look at our very wonderful website, and I think it's a, a very well designed website. Um, you will definitely get to see our prerequisites. Um, for you to qualify for this particular degree. Then the next step is making sure you get yourself uh, in line for the um, tests, the aptitude test that you have to write in order to just at least prove to yourself, it's not going to keep you out, uh, but it will prove to you that you are able to um, take this, this degree on fully and, and run it to completion. Um, then the next step would be finances because that's a, that's a very big issue. Yeah. You know, um, I think we've been hit very hard um, with COVID um, from, from families paying out of pocket. You know, it's not as easy as it was in the past. So look into bursaries. We have wonderful bursary opportunities at this university. So make use again of the website to, to find um, any bursary um, opportunities available to you. Then uh, residence application. I'm a residence parent, so I'm always going to shout out for residence application. So try to do that as well. Um, and then the ball will get rolling. Uh, the minute your application goes in, the minute you know you qualify um, and you apply, the ball will automatically get rolling. You will get prompted um, by various people and various entities within the university to just get you to give the appropriate paperwork. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, uh, ladies. I uh, really appreciate your involvement and uh, your willingness to share. Uh, really appreciate it. Good luck. Uh, with the future. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, chemical engineer, engineering and next up we have mechanical engineering. My name is Vlala Mare, I'm a mechanical engineering student third year and I'm from Pretoria, Centuria. So the reason I started studying engineering or wanted to start studying engineering is I was always interested in the, the design of things and how things worked. I uh, always wanted to learn the inside of things, taking things apart and yeah, just making the world a more efficient place, making your life easier. So the skills I've learned the past three and a half years of studying is definitely uh, time management, <laughs> learning how to, to manage your time between your studies and social work. I mean, you can't just study your whole life. You have to bring in the balance and start uh, seeing, going, going out with your friends, having a bright night. <laughs> you can't study all day. So yeah, just getting the, the ideal balance for your, for your time. So the reason uh, you should pick NW to study engineering is we are completely on our own. We are a tight unit. We have our own facilities. We don't share it with the other people. So it's quite nice having our own stuff. And yeah, definitely the, the lectures are very nice. You feel like you are a, a person. You're not just a number <laughs> to them. So yeah, you get to, to, they get to know you on a personal level. And they, they have an open door policy. You can really go to them and ask questions, not just about uh, your work and stuff. They're always interested in your, your personal life and they try to make you feel like someone. Yeah. My favorite part of studying engineering is definitely getting to know the, the background of things. Not just seeing how things work, but knowing how they work as well and to see how they, they get better through the years. I'm LJ Grobler. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering at the Northwest University. CETAM started with a research project in 1998 where a master student, Danny Forster, started to develop our own twin screw extruder for Africa. We evolved over a three year period to develop our first prototype, and then in 2007, the university created a spin off company 
to commercialize the technology that was developed. The link between CFAM and the university is that CFAM is the commercialization arm of the research and development that is done at the university around extrusion and processing. We work with the Faculty of Engineering as well as Consumer Sciences to develop new products and application of extrusion. We are now 25 years later since we started with the development of our own extruder. And CFAM has grown into an international company that are producing extrusion plants across the globe. We have plants operating in Africa, in Europe, Asia, as well as Northern America. And we are still doing a significant amount of research and development to be competitive in the international field. Our research and development focus on two areas. The one is focusing on applications of technology, where we develop new recipes, new products for the market. And on the other side, we focus on engineering, where we develop the technology that can produce these new products that we've developed. The establishment of CTHAM that started off as a research project within the university is an excellent example of the symbiotic relationship between universities and industry that can lead to commercial entities. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to urge you to uh, ask us a few questions. Uh, we have people here who will answer all of them. Uh, questions about engineering, but then also questions about life in general. I think we we'll have. Uh, we have people who are extremely solution driven because they're all engineers. So log in with your Gmail account and ask us a few questions on, on YouTube. Uh, we see the feed coming through and we're more than willing to answer all your questions. We're moving into the world of mechanical engineering now. Uh, uh, ladies, gents, we've had people here talking about mechatronic engineering. Uh, and that was the closest we got to mechanical engineering. Mm. So I think we first need to establish the boundaries of what it is. Uh, Dr. Fortunate Moyo is sitting right next to me. Do uh, doctor, thank you so much for being here. Okay. Uh, and I'd like to start with you. Just tell us uh, what is mechanical engineering because we, we have this mechatronic thing going mm. in our minds now and this is something else. Yes, that's, uh, mechanical engineering is uh, different. Uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, the objective or at the core of mechanical engineering is uh, problem solving using design, uh -huh. right? Uh, so when you come to uh, mechanical engineering, you are taught modules about uh, phenomena like uh, thermodynamics, like fluid dynamics, materials, and so forth. That will assist you in designing uh, mechanical components uh, for, for daily use. Uh -huh. yes. So it's daily use. It, uh, I almost thought for a moment that you were only talking about the mining sector. No, 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 no. Oh. no. Uh, that's a, a common misconception that uh, what we design is mechanical engineers only applies in uh, mining uh, industries mm -hmm. because the mining industry is the, one of the most visible industries. Yeah. But uh, what we design in mechanical engineering is applicable to literally any industry. Mm -hmm. It could be the marine, marine industry, food processing, pharmaceuticals, uh, any of those industries, uh, mechanical engineers can work in mm. those industries. They can design for those industries. Doctor, thank you. Uh, 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 Maritz Benson is also here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a lecturer in the school. Um, can you concur this? It sounds very creative. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, you don't expect, you know, engineering being complicated, you expect engineering being complicated and the design work being full of intricacies and so on. Uh, but Dr. Fortune had now explained it's a, it's a little bit more than that. Ah, thank you, Hiepe, for the question. Hi, everybody at home. So uh, I concur with Dr. Fortune. Um, I think it's a difficult question to actually answer because the field of mechanical engineering is extremely wide and it's quite difficult to narrow it down to just a few topics. Mm. Uh, but I think in essence, what a mechanical engineer does is uh, we, solve, we use our... Uh, basic scientific knowledge and our engineering principles and we solve a large variety of complex problems and that basically boils down what mechanical engineering is and we do this specifically by developing technologies mm -hmm. that um, fulfill basic human needs and I'd say mechanical engineering is part of that process of developing the technology from the design and implementation or the design and conceptualization phase up to the um, manufacturing and implementation phase. Mm -hmm. And 
I'd even go as far as to say um, basically every product or service that we are familiar with in modern times have been touched by a mechanical engineer in some way or, or another. So uh, mechanical engineering is really wide and it's also the oldest school of engineering. So Ooh. it underlies basically all other engineering fields. Mm. So it's applicable for basically anything. So if you want to become a mechanical engineer, you will solve problems and you will be challenged with a variety of different problems to solve. And this will not be limited to just the mining sector. It can be anywhere. You can even go into financials if you want to with a mechanical I'm, engineering degree. I'm, I'm uh, the financials. <laughs> we'll explore that a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to how you approach this curriculum wise. I mean, when they start to study, mm. um, obviously it's a well set curriculum. Uh, you've, you've refined it over years of having it here now. Uh, but what does it actually entail? Because now if you say mechanical, the, my first jump, as, as we mentioned earlier, was to the mining sector, massive mm -hmm. mechanics, you know, ma massive machinery going on. But it also, it, it, the, the, the smallest uh, little mechanical thing would also be within your field. Mm -hmm. what, what's actually happening curriculum-wise? What do, what do people study module for module all that? Mm. <laughs> I'll, where, I'll where take this question. Yeah, I think yeah. Karen can also elaborate because she's a student, so she's quite familiar with the process but um, firstly so we maintain a good balance between the basic sciences and engineering sciences and then design so if you study mechanical engineering first of all you need that basis of scientific knowledge to be able to solve most physical problems so you start off by doing the basic sciences which will include math and physics mostly and then you will also be um, able to touch on different fields of engineering. We have subjects that will um, overlap with different fields of engineering. We'll have electrical subjects. We'll have um, definitely a bit of IT and working with computer-aided technology and programming and so forth. And then after, but this discourages many students because it's rather difficult. The science is quite involved and the maths might be quite difficult. But then later on, you'll realize this scientific basis is really important if you want to apply it into your engineering principles. So once you have that scientific background, the engineering principles um, will make use of that scientific background. And there we will study different topics such as fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, um, machine design, mechanical design, strength of materials. And then it becomes really rewarding when you start to apply those basic scientific principles to solve these engineering problems that a mechanical engineer will typically face. And to add into what you said, um, a mechanical engineer will work from the smallest machine component up to the largest integrated systems. A mechanical engineer will be found from, from the micro scale up to the macro scale. And what's, the, what's this financial thing that you spoke about? <laughs> How does that fit in? Uh, so um, <clears throat> many banks, such as APSA and so forth, they like the way mechanical engineers think because um, because we are problem solvers mm -hmm. and we have a good background of basically all the sciences and we are good with math mostly, uh, we can apply that knowledge and that problem solving or the, the way we think about problems in financial systems as well to help to make better integrated financial systems. So I, I've not worked in the financial <laughs> area before, so I don't think I'm the best qualified to to elaborate a bit more on that, but no, I know many, many engineers have moved into the financial yeah. sector before. It's, it's fascinating that it even features in your work. <laughs> I mean, you, you would never guess the, the scope of mechanical engineering would also include something like that. But, uh, but I don't want to go off on a tangent. Uh, um, uh, back to studying mechanical engineering. So what I'm hearing is a very strong balance between the basic sciences mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. applying it. Yes. So mm -hmm. the, the students actually go hands-on and, and work whilst they study. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yes, that's true. Most of the modules that we <coughs> offer uh, at our school involve some practical element, right? Uh, I'll give, for example, material science, which is a first-year module. Uh, there the are practicals associated with that uh, module where you go into the lab, you test uh, the, the, the properties of materials and you write a report. We also have got a practical uh, module, uh, I think it's called uh, PPEP, if my memory serves me right, mm. right, where the student is equipped with uh, skills that they can use in a mechanical workshop, mm -hmm. right, which they can find in any industry that has got mechanical yeah. engineering. 
so they'll be able to translate what they learn uh, in, 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 the, in the workshop with what they then experience in industry. Yeah. Yes. It's, a, it's amazing. And Karen, uh, Karen Skitte is, is a, a, a fourth-year student in mechanical engineering. So you've lived this now. You've been at the other side on, on the receiving end of all this uh, teaching. And so how was it? So if I could just add to the curriculum side, in your first and your second year, you would basically do all the science and maths. And then from your third year, you'll focus more on engineering and how to solve these problems because you first need that background. You first need science and maths to be able to solve these intricate problems. So, um, yes, if I speak about my experience, I would say that it really it prepares you to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's, it's still going to be challenging when you get to your third and your fourth year. But your first and your second year is really your foundation where they prepare you to solve those problems. So do you find that when you go home and you visit your family, they constantly ask you to fix things? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my dad always wanted me from my third year, because in your final year you do a final year project and he just wanted me to build a bry. That's all he wanted me <laughs> to do. Mechanical <laughs> bry. <laughs> Very fancy yeah. bry with all sorts of sensors and things like that. So mm. yes, my, my family does ask me engineering questions and want me to do and things at home. And is that your final year project? No, luckily <laughs> not. <laughs> no, my final year project has to do with aeronautical engineering. So it's um, CFD. We, I have to des redesign the propeller of an electric sailplane. Wow. So you're working with Jonker sailplanes? Or what? Yes, yes. Oh, all right. So one they... of their sailplanes. I have oh, to do for one oh. of their sailplanes. It's wonderful that they're here. I mean, uh, uh, we've been talking about the solar car mm. so much as well. Mm. And they have a close relationship um, <laughs> as well. Mm. Uh, you must have been itching to work on, on the solar car. Because yes. Because it's, 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 it's closely related to your field. Yes, it is, definitely. But I'm more interested in aeronautical and going into that field. I also did my PPL this year, so... I'm okay for the other people to do the solar car. I wanted to do, I wanted to go into aircraft development and things like that. Your PPL, what is what is that? That's my private pilot license. Oh, okay. So yes. that's it because I'm still stuck on this PPAP thing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it sounds like a cool song. I'm doing the PPAP. <laughs> oh, so you've been up in the air and so on. You've been flying. Yeah. So that's my passion. That's why I asked them, can I please do a final year project in that direction as well? Yeah. I'm sure that your dad uh, wouldn't mind, you know, uh, you taking him up in the air and flying. <laughs> you know, he, he wouldn't focus so much on the bride. <laughs> yeah, is it a difficult uh, degree to study? Mechanical engineering. Yeah. I think every engineering degree is not easy. I think it's tough. There are times where you don't have a social life as much as the other students. But you create your own social life. So you mm. create your friends that also study engineering with you and they help you through your mm. degree as well. If it wasn't for my friends, I wouldn't have been as motivated as I am right now mm -hmm. to finish. Yeah. So it is tough, but it's also a lot of fun. I can't believe that I'm actually in my final year right now. Yeah. John, it, it goes by so quickly, doesn't it? We have uh, John von Weyck here, ladies and gentlemen. He's actually not studying anymore. Uh, he studied mechanical engineering and he's working in that field now. Uh, I don't know if you got the balance right, John, between uh, socializing and studying or how did it While work? While I was studying. Thing? Yeah. So um, I do agree with that. Um, having a support structure is very important. Um, if you find yourself in the deep end, completely alone, you know, it, it gets much more challenging. Um, so I enrolled in a, um, what's a Dorps course ace. Yeah. And um, so that's basically where, <coughs> excuse me, I've met, uh, you know, a very close knit group of friends and we basically went through the four years together. Yeah. Um, you know, we studied together, we were in the same teams. Um, so it's, I think it's really important to have that as well. And finding yeah. that balance is also unique to every, every individual student. Um, it depends on your circumstances, you know, who's paying for the, who's paying for the studies, is it a bursary or is it mom and dad? Um, so I think it's, it's unique for every single student, um, but yeah, definitely finding that balance is very challenging. And, and what are you doing now? So currently I'm working for an international company, uh, we specialize in a thermoplastic bearing material. 
Um, and yeah, I've been working there since 2017 um, after I graduated and I've been there ever since. Uh, tell us a, a little bit more about this thermoplastic material. The bearing material, yeah. So uh, before I get to that, I think I just wanted to add a comment on, um, you know, the studying aspect, yeah. um, you know, as a whole. Um, I think what varsity really also teaches you is not only the knowledge, okay? In your first and your second year, there's a lot of overlapping of different disciplines. Um, you know, there's uh, um, a lot of science, there's um, a lot of math, there's some IT, there's some chemistry, so there's a lot of overlapping. And then in your third year, you basically apply that knowledge. But knowledge is only the first step. So what I think makes a very good engineer is someone with a curious mind and someone that likes to uh, problem solve. So basically, university teaches us how to apply critical thinking, um, how to analyze certain situations um, you know, analytically, um, and then you know, applying your knowledge to find a solution to that particular problem. So whilst you're talking about this, did you know from the start you were going to study mechanical engineering or was there a bit of a jump around? I did not. Initially, I was going to go into an economics direction. Um, economics? Economics, yeah. You see. I was going to do an uh, actuaris. Um, yeah, actuary. Yes. Um, but for me, I've always, you know, since I was a small child, I've always had a very curious mind. Um, I used to disassemble everything in the house that I could lay my hands on, um, whether it be computers, uh, CD-ROM drives, radios, you name it. Yeah. Always, always a curious mind. And, and you know, I always uh, had this urge to want to know how it operates. Um, so I had a curious mind, and then I was also good at math and science. Um, so that basically narrowed it down for me to rather go into an engineering direction, but I was very unsure. I did not know how everything was going to play out. I didn't even know if engineering was the, um, you know, the right choice for me. Um, but now, as it turns out, it was. What, what, so did you first study something else before? No, no, no. no. Oh, that you... was when I was still deciding. Oh, so okay. when I was still in school, okay. um, you know, my plan was to go into an economics direction, you know, accountant, something like that, actu uh, actuary. Um, and then uh, when it came to the, uh, to the point of making the decision, um, I instead yeah. opted for mechanical engineering. Uh -huh. Obviously, I got a lot of um, assistance from my parents, um, you know, a lot of people that's been in the industry for many years. Yeah. Um, you know, I did my research and then I decided to instead go into, into engineering. Okay, so back to what you're doing now. So what I'm doing now, so basically we do uh, bearings uh, with a thermoplastic bearing material. Um, so it's essentially just, uh, you know, bearing applications, but instead of a rolling element, it's just, a, um, you know, a, for instance, a bushing, which is basically just a plain sleeve. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also do uh, wear parts. So any, any application where you're going to experience some wear, um, that's where we would introduce our product. It's a self-lubricating product, um, and yeah, that's basically, I've been appointed as the engineer um, to have a look at all these different applications and you know, where we see our product you know, adding some benefit so, in that particular uh, system. Obviously, you do a lot of design work then yeah. as well, uh, but also a lot of testing. Yes, a lot of testing, a lot of design work, and also a lot of sales. So I think <laughs> one thing that Varsity doesn't really um, you know, prepare you that well for is the fact that you are going to be working with people mm. once you get into the workplace. Yeah. So human relations is mm. also very important. Yeah. I know one of the uh, subjects we had was called FIAP, mm. and that basically prepared you how to do professional meetings, set up an yeah, agenda, do about minutes, this. Yeah. Yes, because that's what you apply in the workplace. Mm. And also, you know, you're going to work with people, some people are going to drag their feet, and some people are going to be very proactive. Mm. Um, it all depends on uh, you, know, you as a person, um, you know, some people are there for the paycheck, some people are there to, to prove something to themselves, yeah. you know, to, to chase that curiosity mm -hmm. um, and to apply that knowledge in problem solving. Is it a, a line of, of work that uh, uh, has growth areas? I mean, what, what, uh, can you just, uh, uh, do you need to move on to larger projects or is there a, a management position somewhere in the future? What, What's your career path like as a mechanical engineer? Yeah, so I think there's, uh, there's different uh, ways how it can play out. So either you can go into a uh, predominantly, you know, mainly research, um, or you land up in a position where um, you do, you have to sell a product, or you have to sell a service, um, or you land up in a position where you do hardcore engineering design. And that's all you do. Yeah. So it all depends on you know which direction you take and what yeah. works best for you. Um, personally, I'm a, I'm also I'm basically a technical sales engineer. Mm -hmm. um, so not only do I do engineering design, but I also have to you know put on a pretty face, yeah. um, impress <laughs> the people, sell a product, um, and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of human interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is and again, Varsity basically just prepared me um, you know to apply critical thinking. 
um, you know, whenever I get faced with any problem. Yeah. And that problem can be engineering related, human relations, you know, people that you work with, mm. um, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, fortunately, I never even asked you uh, what what do you like. What's your area of specialization? <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, before I answer you, uh, I wanted to comment on something that Karen brought up. Uh, one of the unique things about the School of Mechanical Engineering here at Northwest is that if you come and join us, you are, you are exposed to expert industries. Uh, you spoke about uh, uh, younger cell, cell planes. Cell planes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Uh, Prof. Archie is a, a, an expert in that field, right? Uh, recently, I think he was out of the country racing, mm -hmm. uh, and he came top three or top five. Yes, he came name. top three, but the cell planes that they built, other people were also competing with their yes. cell planes, and their cell planes actually won the yes. competition. Yes, yes. Wow, so, so he just got into the wrong plane. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. That's where the operator still comes into play. Uh, so the point is that uh, <laughs> if you come and join an, uh, mechanical engineering at Northwest, that is the sort of ex those those are the sort of experts that will mm. teach you, yeah. that you can uh, work with, that you can interact with. Mm. You will be literally standing on shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. So if you come and join mechanical engineering, that's a guarantee. Mm -hmm. And then you asked me which is my favorite uh, area. I love materials, any material, right? Mm -hmm. I love materials, how they're so versatile, <coughs> how they can be used in any industry, yeah. how they can be made to do anything that yeah. we humans want. And the only thing that limits us as far as materials are concerned is our imagination. Wow. And I love that about materials, yeah. yes. That's a great answer, thank you, Dr. It's like magic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maritz, uh, take us home. If uh, they are interested, uh, what's your advice? Where do they start? Do they start uh, in uh, sailplanes or what should they look at? Okay, so that's the wonderful thing about mechanical engineering because it's so broad, we can cater for any type of interest. You can really, if you're interested in creating the best bride there is, you can use your <laughs> engineering or your mechanical engineering principles to create the best bride there can possibly be. So if you want to become a mechanical engineer, um, don't think you are limited to just working on engines and machines and so yeah. forth. That's maybe a little bit of a stereotype that we are mechanics. We're not mechanics. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not mechanics. Um, we are critical thinkers who provide solutions to problems. And that's what a mechanical engineer does. The mechanical part is obviously integral to our solution so because that's where it came from at the beginning when the engineering field was founded back in the 1800s during the Industrial Revolution. But if you're interested in just improving anything um, that humans work with or the environment that we find ourselves in, you can become a mechanical engineer and you will have the opportunity to make the world a better place for anybody. Mm -hmm. So a uh, way to, to answer your question, so where to start. So I first think for the prospective students, the first place is to sit behind your desk and start to study hard mm. because you need to get good enough physics marks, math marks, you need to be proficient in language. Mm. Obviously, as he said, professional communication is really important for a mechanical engineer. Mm -hmm. So you can't just be good at maths and at science, you also need to work on your language skills. And then from there on, make sure you get enough marks because we only select a limited number of students and we have quite a large number of applications. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that you are selected so that you will be able to study at the Norway School of Mechanical Engineering, make sure that you get top marks for your matric results. Mm -hmm. And then from there on, um, I think this has been discussed with most of the engineering schools. We have an engineering test, which you should first off be able to write. Mm. And then based on your engineering test, you will also get the opportunity to be accepted for our curriculum. And um, from there, it's easy. You just register at the Northeast University and then you can come study. And that's where the hard work actually then begins. But it's not just hard work and suffering. If you want to be a mechanical engineer, you should be prepared to be challenged. So mm. that's what we are going to do in our profession at the end of the day, is we're going to be challenged. We're going to have to solve lots of problems. So if you are not prepared to face those challenges and work hard, maybe you're not cut out to be an engineer at the end of the day. But if that is your food and that's what you're looking for, then becoming an engineer will be probably the most satisfying environment that you can find yourself Wonderful. in. Wonderful. Maris, thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Carl. Thank you also for you. And good luck with the, that final year project. I hope it goes well. Thank you. And Thank the bride. You. And the bride. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Fortuna, thank you so much for <coughs> your time you. as well. And John, good luck with the world of work. I hope it goes well. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, that was mechanical engineering. Uh, up next, we're going to listen to the industrial engineers. What is industrial engineering? Industrial engineers optimize systems by creatively designing solutions that integrate people, processes, technology, and data. Industrial engineering originated more than a century ago during the Industrial Revolution when industries started to search for the best, cheapest, and fastest way to manufacture products. However, today it is imperative to employ industrial engineers in various industries due to the emerging challenges of the Industry 4.0 era and the current demand of the marketplace. What do industrial engineers do? Industrial engineers are involved across different organizational levels and are responsible for various tasks such as analysis of data and problems, design of systems and processes, planning and optimizing of current systems and processes, management of operations, projects and maintenance activities, the integration of systems, processes, people and technology, and improving overall efficiencies and profits in an organization, modules and knowledge. At the NWU, our undergraduates are trained in various subjects that form part of the following knowledge areas. Optimization and control, statistics and simulation, operational excellence and supply chain, programming and IT, business improvement and management, and manufacturing design. Where can you work? Industrial engineers may work in almost any industries, for example, aerospace and aviation, agriculture, banking and finance, food industry, healthcare, IT and telecommunications, logistics and supply chain, manufacturing, mining and energy, and service and consulting. Hi everyone, we are the lecturers in the School of Industrial Engineering at the Northwest University. So what is industrial engineering? Industrial engineers optimize systems by creatively designing solutions that integrate people, processes, technology and data. Industrial engineering originated more than a century ago during the Industrial Revolution when industry started to search for the best, cheapest and fastest way to manufacture products. However, today it is imperative to employ industrial engineers in various industries due to the emerging challenges of the Industry 4.0 era and the current demand of the marketplace. Industrial engineers are involved across different organizational levels and are responsible for various tasks such as analysis of data and problems and design of systems and processes. They are also involved in the planning and optimizing of the current processes and systems, management of operations, projects and maintenance activities, the integration between your systems, processes, people and technology, and improving the overall efficiencies and profits within the organization. At the NWU, our graduates are trained in various subjects that include the following knowledge areas, optimization and control, statistics and simulations, operational excellence and supply chain, as well as manufacturing design, programming and IT, business improvement and management. Industrial engineers may work in almost any industry, for example, aerospace and aviation, agriculture, banking and finance. They may also work in the food industry, healthcare, IT and telecommunications, logistics and supply chain, manufacturing, mining and energy, and the services and consulting sector. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, uh, we're just having a fantastic evening, talking all about engineering uh, at the Northwest University. Now, in my life, I've had a bit of exposure to industrial engineers, and I'll tell you, uh, the first thing that stands out is they excel uh, at excel. They are really good <laughs> at, at using that program, but there's so much more to them. I'll tell you, just in, in normal business processing, just talking to them, and, and hearing what they think about process enhancement, uh, gaining better efficiency, 
uh, I'm looking forward to this. We have uh, a whole range of experts here, uh, engineers, talking about uh, industrial engineering because we're focusing on the school of industrial engineering. Uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. Let's start with the director of the School of Industrial Engineering, uh, and he's joining us online, uh, as we all <laughs> see, uh, Professor uh, Rosh Siriram. Professor, it's so nice to have you here with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit more about your school and uh, what your school is all about. Let me just introduce the people uh, right next to me as well. Uh, Professor Fani Terblanche is uh, a lecturer here in the school. In fact, he's a little bit more than that. He is an extraordinary oh. professor. So we'll need to explore that as well, Professor, to find out, you know, this is not just a normal uh, <laughs> professor, an extraordinary one. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about his world as well. Uh, we have Hanukkah Meyer, uh, a, an incredibly brilliant uh, young engineer, uh, a lecturer here in the school, but she also does the uh, postgraduate diploma program management, I think, so Hanukkah. Yes. Yep. Uh, nice to have you here as well. Uh, and then we have a, a fourth year student here tonight, uh, Bertu Skols. Bertu, uh, do you have a deadline tonight or do you have time? Friday. Oh, on Friday. Yeah. All right, so you're okay for tonight. Yeah. Uh, we'll get a student perspective then uh, as well. And then uh, from the field, uh, Joshua Wish. Uh, it's so nice to have you here, uh, Joshua, and uh, to hear about your world in the world of work. Thank you for taking the time off. No, thank you, Shepa. All right, Professor Sereram, uh, let's start with a bit of an overview of, of what the School of Industrial Engineering is all about and uh, what is it that you teach, uh, that you're teaching here within the school. Tell us a little bit about your world. Oh, we seem to be running into a, a bit of a problem there. We'll get to uh, the professor a little bit later on. Uh, there's always a bit of a technical snag, right? Uh, Hanneke, so I'll have to pass this uh, on to you. Uh, introduce us into what is industrial engineering. Thank you, Kepia. I, uh, apart from lecturing, I really love talking about industrial engineering. So thank you for this opportunity. Um, so we as industrial engineers, we optimize systems and create solutions to make sure that all the, low, all the role players within the people, the process, technology, they all integrate and work optimally together to ensure an efficient and effective system. So the type of systems we work in is really any system. Yeah. So um, we work in physical systems like manufacturing systems, service systems, hospitals, car manufacturers, etc. Um, but we also work in conceptual systems. So if you think about APSA's online banking, for instance, or maybe even a university's examination process that happens somewhere in the air and things like that. Um, right. So in all those systems, we take a step back. We see are the people, the process, the technology, are they doing what they should be doing? And are they working together as they should be working together to ensure the best system that they can be? You know, I, I once consulted in, a, in the textile industry and I had to go to a factory mm -hmm. and, and I'm in communication so I had a look at that. But I was fascinated by the work that an industrial engineer did on the factory floor. I think the industrial engineer came in and he moved people around. They've been working for that uh, like that for years. Came in saw a few uh, uh, solutions to, to what they were struggling with. I mean, just, just where you position someone in the, in the production line. Hmm. Uh, they increased production like, you know, they, uh, I mean, they, I don't know what the industrial engineer charged, but mm -hmm. they certainly made more money than what, what he charged. Hmm. It's, it's really more often than not the smallest things that almost seems so logical yeah, but and we don't trivial. See yeah. But you're, you're in that environment every day working, so you don't pick up little mistakes you're, you're, you're doing or things you're not doing effectively. And when we see that, that whole picture together and you just make that small change, the impact 
Yeah. It's tremendous. So. Um, uh, but Fani, I, I suppose then uh, your home is running smoothly. Everything is on time. No, you you Absolutely. live. So I don't let anyone uh, else touch the dishwashing machine. <laughs> I know how to pack it efficiently. <laughs> so yes, um, um, I like to be in control there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what made you start out in industrial engineering? Well, I, I had a bit of a journey. So I didn't start initially from, uh, you know, within industrial engineering. So I, uh, I had a bit of a detour. Yeah. Starting in computer science and then um, I did some work in... Uh, um, business mathematics as well and then eventually I, I you know stumbled across uh, industrial engineering but I think it's it's the the mindset and also you know the, the 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 really the need to improve things and to do things more efficiently so it's almost you know inherently part of me yeah but um, it's 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 really exciting and I can't see myself in any other industry yeah. in other in any other um, in your occupation. And, and what are you focusing on now? <clears throat> well, Kepe, I started a company a, a, a couple of years back. So I'm not in academia anymore. So I'm, I'm actually a full-time in industry. Uh, and we work with industrial engineering companies. And we make sure that we provide them with the right tools to actually perform their jobs, you know. So okay, that's, this is a tough job. So you are industrial engineering, the industrial engineer. That's exactly the case, yeah. <laughs> yeah so very exciting. Yeah. So you must be, uh, I mean, just a normal industrial engineer uh, would focus on a variety of industries, but you take it up to the next level. I mean, you see all of it. Yes, definitely. So we, we, we don't really focus on specific industries, and I think that's the beauty of industrial engineering. When you qualify, qualify as an industrial engineer, you can literally work in any industry. You, you can, you know, work in, in banking, as, as Anik referred to. You can, you know, work in mining, um, telecommunications. Mm. So it's, it's, we really equip the industrial engineers with the skills to do problem solving. So it's mm. not about the industry, it's about problem solving. Mm. Joshua, and uh, what is it that you do? I mean, you are in practice now. Yes, um, so I work for a company, uh, Rheinmetall Denal Munition. We just, uh, our site is just outside Potschopstroom, so it was a close drive to this, <laughs> to this video session. Um, so as an IE engineer, uh, well, first of all, Remetal functions within the explosives environment. So we manufacture explosives and ammunition uh, to outside clients, and we also do turnkey plant engineering. And that is where my function falls under. Uh, our department, we build turnkey plant solutions to clients for specific requirements in the ammunition and explosives field. Um, so if they need to have their own sovereignty, we try and provide that based on their requirements. Mm. It's a fascinating world to work in. I mean, I've, I think I've, one, uh, I've, I've visited your site once in my life, and it's like a small town. It's a, it's a big place. Yeah, it's a so, huge so, setup. So definitely. Um, it's, uh, three of our sites in South Africa are also game reserves because of the amount of space you need. Wow. to function within the environment. Uh, it's also a way to give back to the environment. But yeah, it is because you need all of that space to have safe production facilities uh, with what we're working with. Mm. All right, well, we'll come back to your life a little bit uh, uh, later on. I'd like uh, to welcome back uh, Professor Serena. Uh, Professor, are you with us now? Uh, yes, I'm with you now. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming back to, to us. Uh, we've had a fascinating journey about what industrial engineering is all about. So if, if you'd be so kind as to latch on to the teaching of industrial engineering, what is it that you guys within the school focus on? Uh, industrial engineering, similar to the other engineering disciplines, the initial years are focused on the sciences, uh, the physical sciences, the, the economic sciences. So industrial engineers similar to all other engineers, have a solid foundation in the sciences. And it's only in the later years, the third and fourth year, you start really getting into the industrial engineering disciplines and focusing on the pure industrial engineering subjects like operations research, uh, operations excellence, uh, statistics, computer programming, simulation modeling, um, uh, data analytics, and, and human factors engineering, supply chain management. Uh, in, in the, the initial years, you get a strong 
foundation in the sciences because it teaches you how to think. And industrial engineering is very difficult to define. You ask different industrial engineers to define it, you'll get a different answer. I spent 30 years in the field. So I defined industrial engineering as an integrative multidisciplinary field. So what does that mean? That means as industrial engineers, you are trained in the sciences. You're also trained and you have a broad overview of the other engineering disciplines, mechanical, electrical, chemical, metallurgical, mechatronic. So you do a lot of, you are exposed to that kind of thinking. And together with that, with that knowledge, you have a deep focus in core industrial engineering courses and subjects that I've just mentioned. And that holistically positions industrial engineers to run and manage, design, run, manage large complex systems like large organizations. Uh, and they are well positioned to do that. And they have a, also a very strong financial perspective. And, in that, and given the training and education in industrial engineers, they're in all facets of the economy, from finance to information and communication technology, to mining, to heavy engineering, to ag agriculture, to medical. So any product or service that you can think of was probably had some industrial engineering involvement in the production of that good or service. Now, you've mentioned that you've been uh, in practice for 30 years, and, and I know that as a director of a school uh, in the university, you uh, can get quite bogged down in the greater machinery of the, the university. Do you still uh, find time to practice and or to perhaps even do research into industrial engineering? Now, I'm still very passionate about research in industrial engineering. My main focus in terms of research or thrust in industrial engineering is how do you make organizations more competitive? So how do you take large complex organizations and make them more competitive than they already are? Um, and that's my passion. And together with that, applying critical systems thinking to that and bringing innovative principles to that type of, of, of research. <laughs> Because of industrial engineering, multidisciplinary nature, they are the ideal engineers to transform large complex organizations. I mean, if you take an organization like ESCOM, how do you fix ESCOM? Industrial engineers are well positioned to understand that complexity uh, to transform such an organization and other large organizations, uh, mining houses. I industrial engineering gives you that broad spectrum and how everything fits together and you have the ability to pull things together. So my passion is still in terms of how do you make organizations more competitive? Really, that's only one thing that I'm interested in, and but, but that draws on years of experience and knowledge in industrial engineering. So you ask big questions and you, you uh, mention big names. It's wonderful to hear that we're talking to the people who will be able to survive, uh, to provide big answers as well. Uh, when you spoke about the competitive edge, uh, Profani, I, I, I thought about the solar car because it's also something that we've been talking about quite a lot. Um, and, and it's a continuous strive for them to, to, to get to a position of being competitive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the solar car is a really exciting, interesting project. And uh, I believe the, uh, there are two main areas where industrial engineers can make a contribution. So first is during the, the race, um, they can provide uh, guidance on, on the racing strategies. Um, you know, you have to determine the optimal speed. Um, you have to do this uh, while taking into account you know, what the weather conditions are, what the road profile looks like. And all of that is, is just humanly not possible to do. So what a typical industrial engineer would do is just to derive a mathematical model, uh, apply some algorithm, and that would then give us a solution, you know, a prescription to what the speed should be and, and, and how far the, the vehicle should, should travel to, uh, for, for a specific route. And that's just on the, on the day of the race. But then there's also, while they are building the, yeah, the, the solar car, yeah. then there's, there's a lot of involvement in, you know, for the industrial engineers. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting project. And I think it's a, a, real, a real nice show of a practical 
uh, application of industrial engineering knowledge. Yeah, uh, we've uh, spoken to quite a number of students, Bertu, uh, who was uh, involved. Uh, no, current students, former students, they're all involved in the solar car thing. But I think what fascinated us was the 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 hands-on practical exposure that students in engineering get. I mean, it's not just all physics and mathematics. Yeah. Uh, there's applied knowledge and yeah. application of knowledge that takes place as well. Yeah. So in our course, for example, all of the other all, all of the other engineering disciplines focus a lot on lab work. But as you mentioned, with the um, fab on the textile uh, factory, industrial engineers have to be in the field. In yeah. industrial engineering, we talk about Gemba being on the factory floor, being there, seeing what happens, and when we do practicals, a lot of, in a lot of our subjects, we go to a business and then we approach them and ask them, how can we help you? Like we have this information that we are learning in the subject. How can we use this to help you? And so then, this is, I mean, this is real life businesses. You yeah, real life businesses. It's not simu just simulations. No, like for example, this year, um, I was in a group that helped a fertilizer company in my first year for a subject with Hanukkah we helped at CFAM optimize one of their production um, processes. And that was one of the best experiences I've had to learn how to apply engineering in the field. And one of the best things about industrial engineering and one of the reasons I um, went into industrial engineering is because you get to interact with people. You get to talk to the operator working that machine and ask him, how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? What's your life story? <laughs> what do you think can improve in the system? Because Industrial engineering is one of those empowering disciplines where you can give a worker that is often overlooked a voice to change their situation and improve their life. And I think that's one of the epic things about industrial engineering that other disciplines can't mm. like own is that we actively try to improve the people around us' lives be it in banking, be it in systems engineering of Yeah, I've, I've seen it in management. We, we, they, an industrial engineer would come in and, and solve performance management issues. Like, you know, yeah. you would think it's an HR thing. Yeah, so in industrial engineering, we talk about change management. So when you go into a company, you would ask them, like, what do they want to change? And then you go and you talk to the people, how do they want to change it? And then you try to find a middle ground and then you and then you work on different strategies to convince people. You show them hard figures with computation and you talk to them on an emotional level mm. and you actively try to help keep people's jobs but also to help improve the company's mm. profitability because in the end, money makes the world go around, yeah. sadly. It's, it's amazing, Bert. What, what are you working on now in your final year project? Um, so for my final year project, it actually focuses on electric vehicles coincidentally, not solar vehicles, <laughs> um, but my final year project focuses on um, investigating the South African electric or the South African vehicle market and how electric vehicles are affected by various factors such as load shedding and the supply chains in the country. Like for example, if you start manufacturing them in the country, how will that impact the broader, um, manu or the broader adoption of electric vehicles? Mm. What made you decide on industrial engineering when you, I mean, from school to where you are now? So my first certificate that I got as a kid said that Batu wants to play with too many things. <laughs> <laughs> so that hasn't changed. I love all the engineering disciplines. Um, I am a people and a thing focused person. So I want to play with gadgets, but I also want to help people. So industrial engineering was just like the logical choice when someone told me what an industrial engineer does and I was just like that's this that's what I want to do yeah, yeah. so basically immediately appeal to you yeah basically playing with everything and getting to talk to people <laughs> every yeah. day yeah you see all the, all the excitement Yoshi I, uh, uh, I heard however that it's a relatively young degree within the faculty uh, uh, didn't you and, and Hanukkah graduate more or less at the same time? Yeah, you heard correctly. We were the guinea pigs. Um, <laughs> so that they know how to uh, implement the modules for the students. But yes, me and Annika, uh, we were part of the first group that came through the School of uh, Industrial Engineering. Um, and to see where it's gone now with the modules, uh, what Profani and Profraj, them are doing with the school, uh, I think is exemplary. And uh, I think just seeing uh, young students coming through, I, I mean, it's making a difference all mm. around South Africa. 
Annika, but it's not only the degree, right? You have a postgraduate diploma. Yes, and that's also very new. So we started this year for the first time presenting a two-year postgraduate diploma in industrial engineering. And uh, our first semester is completed and it's been a blast and we have a great class. It's such a wide, wide variety of industries and age and gender and everything together there and we really have a lot of fun in those classes so as well. The, the, the PG dip is, is something that, what, is it only after the four-year degree or is it an area specialization even if you have a master's or what? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's postgraduate, so you have to have, um, a, a, a four NK, year. I think it's NKF level seven if I remember correctly now, so that'll be something like a three-year BSc degree um, or, or any other type of um, engineering degree so it doesn't build on industrial engineering we aim to oh. empower people who maybe end up in industry even studying a different type of engineering but they end up doing industrial related work to to kind of give them that industrial engineering toolbox yeah. so so it's a lot like the four-year industrial engineering degree but just obviously changed for the for the audience yeah, it's, a, it's such a typical industrial engineer <laughs> thing to do to have yeah. a postgraduate diploma <laughs> like that here. Yeah. All right, we have to say goodbye, Prof Raj. Uh, I, I want to conclude with you. Uh, uh, if someone is watching now and they're interested, you know, what, what should they do? What, what would your recommendation be for someone that has on his certificate, uh, I keep myself busy with too many things? What's your advice? I think the first thing is most people that's sitting and listening to us now are probably in metric. So work hard, make sure you get the right marks in maths and science because the intake, we have limited places. The intake is, uh, the, in, the selection criteria is really stringent. So you need to make sure you do well in math, science and your, and your languages. And you need to work hard because engineering degree is a hard working degree. If, if you work hard, then you are bound to be successful. It's an extremely intense degree. You are busy from eight o'clock to five o'clock every day. Uh, and then you still have to work late at night. So get used to working hard. So make sure you get your, your, the target marks that you need to get accepted. Then take our online test. It's an aptitude to, to, to see if you have the aptitude to study engineering. That's not going to, if you don't do well and it doesn't mean you're not going to get accepted. Then go on our website and make sure you understand the admission criteria uh, and then apply. And then also make sure you have the funds available. We have a lot of bursaries available. So apply for that. And then after that, it's let the process take, take its course. We also have set up a, a WhatsApp group for prospective students. So if you have any questions, uh, log on to that WhatsApp group, ask the questions. We, are, we will answer them. Somebody will answer them. And um, industrial engineering has a great, fu great future. It's one of the 10 scarce skills in the country. An industrial engineer will get a job quite easily, provided you have good marks, obviously. And it's one of the professions that you will get promoted to senior management very, very quickly because of the broad exposure and the management training that you have. So it's a very interesting, but challenging and hard discipline. It's hard work, hard work, hard work. Prof. Raj, thank you so much uh, for those insights. And I might just say that you look good in a tie uh, this time of the evening. Thank you so much for wearing it. <laughs> I had to wear it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Professor. And uh, to all of you also, uh, good luck. Uh, you shall stay safe, I mean, in your world, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to, to come and visit. And we've never got round to the extraordinary part of the extraordinary Professor. Yeah, I'm, I'm still wondering about that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, thank you so much for availing yourself. Uh, Anika, good luck. I think we'll be talking a bit more uh, later on. Bertu, good luck with your studies, right? And Thank stop you. fiddling about with all sorts of things. Focus. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Bertu, thank you so much for taking the time off. Good luck with Friday. See oh. deadline. Yeah, good luck. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we've covered industrial engineering now, but now if you're curious as to uh, how the application process works, um, uh, the duration of study, the mode of delivery, uh, uh, costs, bursaries and so on, that's where we're heading off to now. We'll see you just now. Hi, my name is Denise Gitter and I am part of the solar car team. It was an amazing experience and I would like to share my involvement. My master's entails me doing research on vanadium redox flow batteries. Therefore, I did a, a lot of research on different battery types and heat transfer um, through batteries, uh, uh, lithium ion batteries, due to uh, soldering or welding which uh, method would be best. I also was part of the documentation regarding safety measures of the battery, so um, battery safety, battery ma um, maintenance, and also preventative measures and care of the battery, just to ensure that uh, we get the most out of the battery's life cycle. I also got my hands a little dirty, um, helping with the base of the wing and and the ba uh, way the solar panels is uh, situated and fastened, uh, and that was um, quite fun. I also did a bit of sealing and painting and just um, small odd jobs around um, the cabin, which was also a lot of fun. The people um, that's all part of the solar um, car team is amazing people all of them very supportive very nice and uh, i would recommend anyone just to join it and be part of that so such an amazing project and team thank you Ladies and gentlemen, now it's your opportunity to ask a few questions if you want to. Make sure that you're logged in, just your Gmail account, and then you ask a few questions on uh, the YouTube feed. Uh, we are tapped into that feed so we can give you live answers back uh, if you want to. It's wonderful to have uh, a, a few people again here on, on, on the round table uh, asking uh, or providing answers to some of the questions uh, towards student life and the logistics of applying and so on. Uh, the executive dean is in her seat. Uh, Prof. Liesel, thank you so much for returning. Uh, and uh, we'll get to the others as we progress along. I think uh, we've covered everything in your faculty, Professor, uh, all the different areas of specialization, and good luck. It seems as if it's a, it's a group of inquisitive, creative people. So it must be difficult to lead them. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a privilege. It's, a, it's, it's never a dull moment. Yeah, never a dull moment. Think, <laughs> uh, because I think they, they come up with so many different opinions and solutions and ideas. It's, it's their way of life. 
uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it was wonderful talking to the experts within your faculty, um, especially the alumni, uh, because you could see how they actually, uh, the link between what they've studied and how they practice it into their, their real life. Yeah. You guys make a lot of effort in getting that balance right. Uh, getting not just the theoretical side, uh, you know, leaving them cold, mm. uh, you really prepare them for, for the professional life. I must say, that's something that we pride ourselves, it's our industry relevance. And, and you've heard also tonight about starting with the solar car, but also the sales plans and CFM and um, industrial engineering, um, industry um, exposure. We really have a very strong link uh, with our industry. Uh, and it's really important for us that what we do is, is relevant. Our, our vision is to change the world for the better, so therefore we must be in touch with the world. And, and you must have a, a, a whole range of laboratories and, and, and uh, areas in which practicals can take place and labs all over the place. Yeah, so uh, right at the beginning you asked me where... Uh, our faculty is positioned, so we're positioned at Potchefstroom, and for that very reason. Um, we are accredited by EXA, and one of the requirements is that we must provide those really hands-on practical mm. lab laboratories. So we have those for undergraduate teaching, but we also have it for our research, our postgraduate research. So we're not only about teaching, we're also about discovering knowledge. So in all of the disciplines, we, we have those facilities. Mm. And it's a large and growing faculty. I mean, we've spoken about industrial engineering being one of the younger degrees added. Um, uh, and even within, I mean, I mean, industrial engineering has a postgraduate diploma, which is another young, youngish qualification within the faculty. It's constantly reinventing itself and, and growing. Yeah, so the, 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 the youngest uh, qualification is megatronics engineering. Oh, of course, yeah. Which, uh, Together with industrial engineering, it shows our relevance. Again, it shows our relevance. Even before the fourth industrial revolution became a buzzword, we realized that we will need those type of programs mm. to, to, to be relevant in the, in, the, in the new world. All right, so we'll come back to uh, the process of applying, registering, what's the difference between being admitted and then actually registering and so on. So we'll come to that in a moment. But I want to say hello to Hotatsu Mpaklele. Hotatsu, where have you been all night? All of a sudden you've popped out now. Are you a student here? Yes, I'm a student. And what are you studying? I'm studying chemical engineering. Chemical engineering. Yes. Uh, who is your, it, we spoke to, who were some of your lecturers then that we spoke to tonight? You have brilliant lecturers there. I mean, the, yeah. I was, you know what, what stood out for me in, in chemical engineering is you would think it's someone, you know, in a lab <laughs> shaking fluids all over the place and there's a bit of vape coming, going around <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, but it's a big thing. I mean, we're talking big industrial mining and so on. Yes. What, what do you like? What, do, what are you specializing in? I'm currently not specializing. I'm, I'm a first year though. A first year? Yes. Well, congratulations. You've made a start. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How, how has that been? I mean, you've caught it at just the right time after COVID, right? Yes. yes. It's beautiful. How, what's your experience thus far? Uh, I can say it was not quite easy. Mm. Because I didn't even understand basically what am I doing in chemical engineering. But then, all thanks to my lectures, they just made a solid uh, basement. Mm. Then I just get to it and then understand what am I doing. What made you decide on, on chemical engineering? Uh, I grew up... Uh, I like to work with chemicals, mm -hmm. and as as I grew up, I didn't know basically where my at at this time. But I remember I was in grade ten. I had to decide which field I had to like pursue with. Mm. Then it was quite so hard to choose between maths and science and accounting, because mm. I was quite so confident in accounting, mm. and I was also confident in maths and physics. Mm. Yeah. But then I realized that I want to work with, like, in an environment that will, like, ut I can utilize my skills and improve my engagement in it. So well, the, the people thus far said that the first two years are a bit general, yes. uh, but, but still focused, obviously, because you're registered for a degree. So it's not just, you know, everybody does the same thing. 
Uh, but the real application comes when you hang in there and you become a little bit more serious in terms of finishing, you know, and, and positioning yourself in the world of work. I'm looking to the two ladies right beside me because they are there now. I mean, they, they spoke earlier and they spoke magnificently about, you know, what they are focusing on. Uh, Karen Mana, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, uh, do you remember the time when you were first here? Yes, it was really long ago. <laughs> <laughs> time flies by real quickly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. You should enjoy it right now. <laughs> yeah. Listen to the old people speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you guys sit here with your beautiful black jackets, uh, Northwest University emblem position there. Uh, you're, not, you're doing a little bit more than just studying. You, you've gone involved in student leadership, right? Yes, so I'm the chairperson of the engineering chapter and I have Marna Arantz here, she's my secretary of the engineering chapter as well and we are the academic student body of the engineering faculty. So, the so you don't just focus on one degree, it's the entire faculty? Yes, the chapter is, is a mix, so I'm a mechanical student and Marna is a chemical student, so any student can be part of the engineering chapter and every faculty also has a chapter, so we are part of the engineering chapter specifically and we focus on the students. So our main focus is on the students, student life. We also deal with the academic side as well. So we deal with the complaints that the students are experiencing. Which and complaints? <laughs> no, we sort them out real quick. Yeah, they don't end up at the dean. That's why the dean doesn't know about the complaints. So if the student has a problem, then we will allow the student to contact the class representative and make them contact the lecturer as well and sort the complaint out as quickly as possible and as smoothly as possible. But you mentioned, you know, a whole committee, the secretary, I'm sure there's someone with an academic portfolio. Yes. What are some of the, the other portfolios that you also have within your chapter? So we have our marketing member, so he's responsible for all our posters that we create for the events that we have. Then we have our finance member, so he deals with the finances. Luckily, we don't have to do that. Then, of course, we have a deputy chairperson as well. We have an external liaison member, an internal liaison member. Internal is basically responsible for all the social events that we have inside our faculty. And the external liaison member liaises with the other faculties as well as other universities as well. Wow. And then we also have yeah. our um, current affairs member. She focuses on all the current affairs such as diversity week and Green Week and all, all the things that are currently relevant at the Northwest University. And then we also have our SRC ACE member. They are basically responsible for charity work and, for example, Barefoot Day where we collect clothes to people that can't afford clothes and things like that. And what other portfolios do we have? No, I'm, but trying I mean, to, yeah. I'm trying to think because we're 11 people, so... Yeah, no, no. But, I, but I mean, I, I, I just want to ask Marna now, you mentioned social events for yes. engineers. Yes, yes. of course. <laughs> yes, it, so tell us fun. about this now. So, um, one of the events that we, what, that we are going to have uh, at the beginning of September, and we all are really um, excited about that, is the engineering formal. So that is where we all dress up real nice and we go to a nice event and... A um, bit of dancing, a bit, a bit of, of dancing, wine and dine. Exactly like that. <laughs> Holding <and> hands. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, and just to, to get the other engineers, um, we get to know them better in a more social um, setup um, instead of uh, the academic setup. Um, um, we, we really are still social people. <laughs> Although there's a misconception that we are not. <laughs> it's only but joking. Yes, we, we do love socialising a lot. Yeah. So. Uh, what are some of these uh, 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 other events you've mentioned now? Uh, I like the, the charity component because I think, you know, there is a lot that we can see engineers doing back, uh, giving back to society. I think you approach it from a totally different point of departure than someone in humanities or someone in economic and management sciences would. Yes, so I know um, the, the uh, person um, responsible for SRCS, um, she also is a chemical engineering student, um, also in her final year, but she, the things that I do, they do, that build physical things that could help schools um, and other persons in a, in a way that they didn't know they needed it. So, for example, I know last year, um, when I was not 
I was also part of the uh, the, com um, the committee. Um, we helped building things to play with um, out of the engineering type. So we helped building um, building blocks out of wood and painted them. And I know we also uh, built a machine to dispense um, hand sanitizer because no, it's not, it topical yeah, at it's topical yeah, yeah. at the time. So we, we've come in from a very different different side for the charity. Yeah. Um, not focusing on the phys the um, the direct needs, but the indirect needs as well. Mm. So yeah, that's but, also one thing. But uh, Karen, you also mentioned liaisons with other universities as well? Yes, yeah, so um, I just want to add on what Marna said. So our external liaison member, he is responsible for Ingenious Kids as well. And Ingenious Kids is also sort of a charity initiative where they go to less privileged schools to help the grade nine learners to teach them maths and science, to encourage them to take maths and science in grade 10 so that they are eligible to study engineering. Um, and then on top of that, the external liaison member is also responsible for engaging with other universities. Although it's not a prerequisite, so not all the chapters from the different faculties do that. I think we're the only faculty that does that. So we are having a dine with the University of Pretoria their student leadership structure, and we invited them to come to our formal dine as well. Well, you are importing now other yes. engineers and yes. dates and so on. I see a whole <laughs> thing to it. Must be an industrial engineer. He's <laughs> got this whole thing going. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I, I love what they're saying, uh, Professor, because uh, I know there's consistently a drive towards internationalisation, uh, and each faculty has. Uh, uh, engagement. I mean, even even your experts would have to have an, an international standing, right? So there's a there's a drive towards internationalisation at the faculty too. Uh, for example, um, we have in our research um, entities with the University of Twente, um, University of Newcastle, New Australia, uh, um, some American universities as well. It's, it's, the, the internationalization is very much linked to the um, to the research. Researchers work together on, on international aspects. What is important is to know that our degrees are internationally recognized. So, so you will find our alumni all over the, the world, like you, you saw uh, uh, right, yeah, right from Croatia and so yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so in that sense, you you. Yeah, you will find you will find our footprint all, all over the country and uh, all over the globe, and um, in terms of research projects, we work with, with quite a few universities. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, it it really not only broadens your your mind but also your horizons. I mean, you get exposed to to so much. Uh, let me move on to uh, something that I know people are often asked, uh, and that is the finances. Uh, it, it's expensive to study. So the first question is, Khutatsu, uh, uh, Karn and, and, and Marna, should we ask for more pocket money? Are you surviving? Uh, <laughs> are you meet, uh, making ends meet? Um, are you hungry now? <laughs> <laughs> no, luckily we have a great faculty that provides us with food. <laughs> this thing. Um, as a student, you never have enough money, yeah. of course. That is just... <laughs> If you are not a student, if you don't have enough money, that's a that's a, that's a that's a need, that's a thing. You that's that's just how it is. Um, but we all we try to we sell old handbooks um, for pocket money. We there's also a thing at the university where you can do be a demi or that is a demonstrator so assistance to another module uh, that you already have done. So you can help other students and also you get paid. For doing that or when you mark you get paid for that as well so there is this okay there is ways how you can support yourself as well mm. so mm. and uh, we encourage people to do that because it's not it's not helping themselves but it's also helping other students as well mm. so yeah uh, but the 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 broader issue of bursaries um do you have bursaries available professor uh, um the bursaries come from many sources. The first type of bursary is merit bursaries from the university. And the Northeast University's first year merit bursaries are very generous. If you have a 100, if you're, if you're in the top in your, of your grade 12, then you can get up to 100% discount on your, on your studies. Um, so, so that's generous. The, the other source of bursaries are from industry. 
There we have a bursary office, Claudia Kruse. Um, so if you would like to have a look at our website, you will find the information, you will find her name. She has an office here. And her in the faculty? In the faculty, just a few offices down here. And her work is to build relationships with the bursarers and also to be instrumental in... Um, sometimes she will organise the bursary interviews. Uh, she will also assist the students with the applications and so on. So it's not our faculty that provide the bursaries, but we provide the service of liaising with industry. And the fact that we industry relevant, the fact that we anyway have good relationships, anyway collaborating with industry helped us. Um, it's, I, must, I must be honest that it's more difficult, it's, there's less bursaries in the first year from industry, because the industry partners would like to see success in the first year. But that's why it's convenient that the Northeast University's um, uh, merit bursaries for first years are, are, are well positioned. And then, of course, there's also NISFAS. And Claudie is also assisting um, our engineering students with NISFAS bursaries. So the thing is, just try. You know, go and explore those options. Try and knock on the doors. Get, get admitted first. If well, you admit course. it, then, mm -hmm. then you can use that as a, as a leverage to apply for bursaries. So whilst you put that on the table, uh, let us just walk through all the, the different phases. Uh, it's application, admittance... And re registration. And registration. That's basically the three phases, yeah. yeah so application is, is when you need to knock on the door. Admission is when the door is opened for you. And registration is when you walk through the door. So um, to, to register, you need, you've heard it, right, math and science. And, and yeah, that's your ticket, plus other things. Um, the application process um, on the website, also on the engineering website, please have a look. There's people that can help. Um, then, before you matriculate, you don't have a matriculation certificate yet, but we have enough reason to, ad to provisionally admit you. Mm -hmm. So I, there's, about, there's, there's quite a few hundred learners out there who's currently provisionally admitted for 2023, which means we believe, we, we, we trust that they will be able to get the minimum requirements, in which case they will automatically be, um, be allowed to register. So when when does the does this start? It sounds like it's almost at grade eleven. You should you must start knocking on doors or um, sending through your name. The, the application process opens up university wide always in April. So um, you your faculty is also in line with those dates. Yes, yes, and then um, strictly spoken strictly spoken, there's a deadline, but but we do consider applications even now um, mm. for next year. Okay, now um, we have uh, to a few ladies here, and I know that the faculty is is doing well in working towards getting uh, a, a woman in engineering, right? Uh, I don't know, uh, Karen, if you can tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Uh, I'm sure you've been involved. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the faculty does there. So um, the faculty has a very a uh, big initiative to encourage women in engineering and this is started from high school. So I attended the Femme Engineering event which was held yesterday yeah, at the, the Northwest University Engineering Faculty Building as well as in Sanson. And when I was in my matric year it was also held here on Potterstrom campus and that was one of the reasons why I decided to study engineering. So Femme Engineering is aimed at, at girls that are currently in high school to encourage them, to tell them you can also study engineering and um, then my, my first year, second year, third year and final year I help to with the organisation of the engineering as well. Oh. I may also add that Gagatatsa was also a respond, um, part of yesterday's event. So it's not just for, for the, the, uh, the goals in our faculty to be part of, it's anyone that have a passion of being a role model mm, mm. to be part of that. Uh, Hotato, tell me a little bit about, you know, your choices. You're sitting here now, you've, you've uh, come far. I mean, we are, we are now in August and, and you, you, you've seen a few things since when you started at the beginning of the year. Have you made the right choice? Can I put you on the spot and ask mm -hmm. you straightforward? Have you made the right choice? I think I made the right spot because uh, all my capabilities 
of our food. Mm. Like, what I, what I can say is that uh, I like chemistry. And then, yeah, I can come in there as chemistry. And then I see where I'm going. Mm. Yeah, our first semester was just uh, transitioning from high school to university. But then, yeah, I think I found the right foundation. Yeah. I'm Isn't on the right wonderful? Track. I mean, uh, d uh, congratulations on that. Because, I mean, uh, uh, making that choice, finding that spot, getting into the groove of this is the rhythm of my life. It's, it's wonderful to find that and to find that in the faculty. Yeah, yeah all right. Now, Prof, any uh, last words from your side before we say goodbye? Um, obviously, uh, perhaps just, you know, what's the next step? What happens now? Marika just remind everyone that our faculty vision is really to change the world for the better. And we need to, to do that. We need to, to have engineers. We need to have learners who are keen to, to do that. So the first step is you, you must want to be an engineer. If you listen tonight and you realize it's not for you, then it was also a successful evening in that sense. But I really hope that those of you who considered it as a, as a career realize that you can really make a difference in the world. So that's the first step. A second step is to, to um, sit and study and make sure that you have your math and science um, marks. I think you've heard that. I, I think that, that penny dropped. And then um, apply. Even, even if you would like to apply for 2023, please do it now. We will consider your application. And, um, and, and then keep communicating with us. Um, as soon as you have applied, you're on our database, and we will, we will make sure that we have regular updates and opportunities for you to... Uh, you mentioned the database, and I've also heard stories about that, you know, get onto the faculty's database. It's, it's important because then, you know, you get notifications and you get all the communication mm -hmm. from the faculty side. You know, it even becomes irritating, but... Yeah, but, I think most but it's necessary. <laughs> yeah, you need to know that. Yeah. Uh, to the Executive Dean, thank you so much for your time, Professor. Uh, you are very busy, I know that, and, and you took the time to spend some time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's really a privilege. Uh, ladies, uh, remember that there is no limit on the budget for shoes when it comes to formal. <laughs> so for the formal, enjoy it Thank and uh, wear nice shoes. Thank you. Oh, you all right. and keep it for the graduation ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> you will always find that's something. That's always also coming up. Yeah. <laughs> and Khodatu, uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, you know, in, in a few years' time, we'll speak again. Yeah. Uh, good luck with your journey. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. This was the overview of the Faculty of Engineering, and we hope to see you apply for studies at the Northwest University. A single step. A decision to open the door. To see what's out there. <laughs> to see what's inside you. What the world has to offer. What you can give. What you're made of as you dream about what you can make. You will build and you will fall. But each day, you will be wiser, stronger, and above the rest. You will soar. And one day, even as you keep moving forward, you'll pause to take a look back. You'll reflect on all you've learned, on all you've seen and everything you have done. And you'll be grateful you took that first, single step on a journey of discovery at the Northwest University.